Tak semula. Tak semula. Aspek biasa. Ah. Biasa. Ah. Yes. Okay. So, angka kau ni, le, ingin tu kata formal, agak tak formal. Ingin tu ni apa? Okay. Tukar pernah, jadi alih alih face. Okay, fine, fine, okay. Fine. So sorry for the interpretation. I am continuing again. So as far as the cyclone is concerned, you have this system in the sea, but you will get an apparent feeling that it is a solid object, but it is not. It is only a disturbance that is moving. Generates rain and moves again. But a continuously, if you view a satellite picture, you do get a feeling. That a solid object is moving. That's all. So it is not. That's the important thing. And we have already seen the eye, and the eye wall abutting it, and when it will form, all these things I have given. It will form only when you have the sea surface temperature is more than 26 degrees Celsius. The wind shear should be low. That is, winds at different levels should not be in opposite direction. The vertical structure will not be available. That's the thing. And it forms a little bit away from the equator. Because it uses the Coriolis force, which is generated to the rotation of Earth, which is having a very low value. It is the value is zero at the equator. So it is having some meaning of value a little bit away, say for five degree north or south. So you generally expect can expect a cyclone storm to form in the latitudes. Very rarely they form in low latitudes. I do remember year two thousand four. When one or two systems formed around two degrees north, like that, but they generally form five degrees north or south. There's a thing. And as far as the heavy rainfall is concerned, it is only in the eyeball region will have plenty of rainfall. And the horizontal extent of the system is something around hundred to thousand kilometers. Generally, five hundred to six hundred kilometers you can see in tropics. Only extra tropical systems will be very huge. And as far as the vertical extent is concerned, 10 to 15 meters, even sometimes 16 meters, also you can see. 
the average system as a whole will be 300 km per day here will be only the confusion will come because the rotational speed around the center matters only if it crosses 63 km you call it a cyclone then you give names and all and a super cyclone means it will go even beyond 222 km per hour so that is different that is at the center but the system as a whole it will move around say some 300 per day you should not confuse that is very more important now this is the chart which shows the classification you can see if i take a chart and analyze the chart with the data if i can draw a full circle it is called a row one circle if i can draw two circles one circle within one we call it a depression three if it is a deep depression four or more cyclone like that more the number of uh, circles so strong is the speed so what happens the aerial extent is not very important mind it is only the wind speed in the center that matters wind speed and wind speed alone is the criteria and certainly not the aerial extent so that is important so if it is a low i will be drawing one circle and the wind speeds will be less than 31 km per hour if you are not able to draw a circle at all only a kink it is called a trough that's all in depression the wind speeds will be out of 31 to 51 if it crosses that after 62 you call it a deep depression beyond 63 you call it a cyclone after 87 km per hour if it is happening in the indian seas you call it a tropical cyclone if it happens closer to north america we call it a hurricane and if it happens in your asia pacific region we call it a typhoon like that so the name only differs but as far as the wind speed is concerned the criteria is concerned that 63 to 87 matters it is a cyclone or a hurricane or a typhoon and then uh, the severe cyclone uh, up to 117, very severe cyclone up to 165, and then extra severe cyclone 221, if it crosses, you call it a super cyclone. But this criteria is only for the Indian seas, by, by India Meteorological Department. As far as the other seas are concerned, as far as the hurricane scale is concerned, the scales are different. They have category 1, 2, 3, up to 5 categories. In America, the wind speeds are different. And as far as the Australia is concerned, their scales are different. So I am showing only with the respect to the Indian seas. But one thing is different common for all the basins. It should cross more than 63 kilometers per hour to call it a cyclone or a typhoon or a hurricane. That's it. So in this picture, what you are seeing, you can see it says Katrina making a landfall. The center touches the land, you call it a landfall. Once it crosses the land, it is bound to weaken. Why it should weaken? Because of the frictional force and water is the main store of strength for the system to grow. That will also be cut off. So that is the reason why uh, when it makes a landfall, we say it as a landfall and uh, once it travels into the land, it is bound to weaken. What are the conditions in which it can weaken? Either it should enter land, so due to friction forces it should weaken, or it should go into a cold sea where the temperature is less than 26 degrees Celsius and it is bound to weaken. Or if it is subjected to wind shear alert, winds coming in different directions, you can shear off the top portion from the lower portion. Then also it will weaken. The subsequent next picture here you can see the center where you have a cloudless region. Why there is a cloudless region? Because here the air doesn't go up, air is coming down. So adiabatic compression is happening there. That is why you don't have much cloud activity is there, not is there, not there. 
only averting the eye wall you have what is called the huge convective activity you can see tower as cumulonimbus clouds even touching up to 16 17 kilometers per hour so in this picture you can see just averting the center you have a huge column of clouds you can see tall clouds this red color all indicates a uh, huge water uh, content so the averting the the center the eye wall cloud region only will be the region where you will have maximum rainfall activity now as far as the damage is concerned heavy rainfall generally commences 9 to 12 hours before the landfall when the center touches this land you call a landfall so before that itself because the outer cloud region will be touching the land that is why you have a lot of rainfall activity will be there when it even commences gale force winds will come in 6 to 9 hours during the advance of cyclone of course as far as the today i am not going to touch about the wind forcing what are the effects of wind forcing and all i am not going to touch we we'll discuss about it maximum storm surge may appear because the level of sea will increase due to strong winds what will happen the sea will inundate inside the land just as far as our east coast is concerned north of the uh, point where it is going to cross will have what is called as storm surge so that is also a another hydrological disaster because the sea water will inundate and it will affect the fertility of the land the land will have brackish water salt water in fact during 1999 when we had the uh, the super cyclone over uh, orissa odisha they couldn't do meaningful agriculture operations for three agricultural seasons so this is a real problem and one more thing is the storm surge when it enters the land once it recedes it will take whatever and will go back to sea so it will, it will lead to huge destruction these are all the problems as far as the storm surge is concerned so in the top two pictures you are able to see that the place where the land is at a higher level the water storm water is not able to enter only if it is a strong force wind forcing is there it can enter otherwise it, it may not be so this is called the bathymetry of the sea the bathymetry of the coast that matters in this place you don't know which is sea and which is land they are at the almost the same level so water is able to inundate and cause huge destruction so this effect of the storm surge the inundation in this picture india meteorology department has calculated what is the maximum probable storm surge based on the bathymetry of the sea so you can see the highest level of the storm surge possible Uh, in the west bengal in the south 24 perganas as well as the medinapur district something around 13 meters so the huge wall of water sea water can formed if there is a very strong system 13 meters means if you multiply by 3.3 you will get in feet something around 40 feet of yeah sea the water wall can come if there is a very strong uh, cyclonic storm very severe cyclonic storm extra severe cyclonic storm comes can it can lead to that wall and inundation inside and as far as tamil nadu is concerned you will only in rameshwaram here it is around 12 meters that you don't know which is sea and which is land they are almost at the same level so as a result you will have this problem in fact on dharish kodi got affected due to that only during a cyclone which ravaged that area under so uh, next time coming to thunderstorms thunderstorms also can create oh, uh, water uh, this is a related disasters how it can create when all those things we are going to see
generally you have this kind of categorized two things. One is an airmass thunderstorm, and the other is a severe local storms. And further, you have even tornadoes. I am not discussing all those things. It is a rarity in, as far as India is concerned. In marked contrast to the United States, where it will occur at uh, frequent intervals, especially in Florida State and all those things. Now, let us see the air mass thunderstorm. Here, what happens? Earth is not heated by the direct, direct sunlight. It is a re radiation of the Earth which is the atmosphere. So when you have uh, re radiation of the Earth in, during summer, it heats the lower levels in the atmosphere as a result. It rarefies, it gets heated and it can set in convective motion and the air goes up. And then it gets cooled down as it moves up because it has to do work against gravity to move up. So it is done at the cost of its own internal energy. Since it is done, internal energy, the internal energy forms, the temperature of the air parcel will fall. So as a result, what will happen? So the saturated air will become water droplets. So this is convection. So what exactly is a convection? You have doubts. So let me put it in other words. Take a pot, kettle, and eat it in your stove. What happens? Air bubble falls, and then you are having a water vapor too. You have a plate over that uh, kettle. What happens? You get the formation of the droplets, water droplets below the plate, cool plate. You call it a water droplet. The same water droplet you are able to see in the space, you call it cloud. So, cloud is nothing but your water droplets. So, this is your formative stage. And then you have a, these water droplets, they hit against each other, they coalesce, they become big, bigger droplets. Once they become bigger droplets, gravity comes into play. Due to gravity, the heavier droplets will fall towards the ground. So that you call the downdraft. When the air goes up, you call it an updraft. When it comes as a aqueous particles, water particles, you call it a downdraft. So when simultaneously, when both of them occur, you call it a mature stage. When the upper uh, updraft totally becomes stops, only downdraft comes. It is a dissipating stage. So this is how the air mass thunderstorms will end its life. So they may last maximum half an hour or at the most one hour and nothing beyond. That's all. What will happen if this updraft is separated from the lower draft, low draft, down draft? Such a scenario is called severe local storm. This is your severe local storms. At a higher elevation, there will be a flow of air in a horizontal direction so that the updraft is separated from the downdraft. In one place, the air will continue to go up. In another place, the air will continue to come down. So there is a separation of both. So this is uh, known as severe local storm. So that you are seeing. So one place it will go up. Continuous rain will be there. This will last for hours. Sometimes six hours, seven hours and all. And if this cloud doesn't move, what will happen? Then it is called cloud burst. That's all. That's the name given. Not that a cloud is seeming in this burst. Because the updraft and the downdrafts are well separated, it continues to rain for a longer period and the clouds remaining stationary. So, this is what is happening and leads to what is called the cloud burst. And we have to define some values for cloud burst. India Meteorological Department has given a classification that if the rainfall uh, rains for more than 10 centimeters in one hour, Within a radius of 20 kilometers, 
then it is called a cloud burst. So you have to be careful. This picture is nothing to do with the hydrometeorological disasters, but this is the place where a lot of people are able to. Do. The reason why a lot of people are able to die due to thunderstorms. In fact, if you add the number of people dying due to lightning strikes throughout the year in different parts of the country and add them together, they will be the number one event in which a lot of people lose their lives. Every life is valuable. In order to save the lives, in order to educate the people, in order, in order to give them the awareness, I am stating this. Though it is nothing to do with the topic of the day. So in many buildings, you can see the building uh, with the wires, surrounded by wires and safely taken to the ground in a dedicated earth pit, which is filled with salt and uh, charcoal. So as a result, the lightning strike, the electric discharge is safely taken to the ground. So as there is no problem with the building. But what will happen when you are in an open area? So when you are in an open area, never stand under the single tree. Because single tree, we would like to reach as quickly as possible to the earth. So people uh, dying due to thunderstorms, mainly they, those who are standing in the single tree, they die. And in the group of trees are there, don't stand under the tallest tree. The best is to be inside the house and don't operate any electrical gadgets. And if you have a TV and all, please plug it uh, from your dish antenna. That is much more important. And you have sometimes have drone wraps also, which is called squall. Strong wind forcing also will be there. I'm, of course, I'm not uh, discussing about that much today. And then this torrential rains also leads to this type of uh, water, uh, water flow, massive water flow along the roads, mainly due to the civic infrastructure. If the water has a way to go without affecting us, absolutely no problem. So what we need is a good storm drain for the water to go freely. It's a torrential rain, what we can do? There is a rain. In fact, one day, uh, Mumbai in 2008, I remember, it had a rainfall of 94 centimeters in uh, Santa Cruz, or something around 8 centimeters only in Colaba. So, such torrential rain occurs, what to do? And if you take Sirapunji and all, it's bound to have a lot of huge extreme, uh, extreme rainfall activities. But the highest rainfall record in India, even the world in 24 hours, is only uh, Sirapunji, 156 centimeters in 24 hours. But it's a hill station area, so naturally it goes to the plains without affecting the local population. But in the civic area authorities, they can't do much in this type of scenario. It's a very difficult uh, uh, thing. So probably proper planning of the city itself is needed to ward off this type of threat. So what civic authorities will do is, they will check the past rainfall data, which is highest rainfall data in an uh, area so far, when it will be, whether it can return or not they will see the probability. It is called return period analysis. If Chennai is there 45 centimeters, was highest record rainfall in Chennai city, in 76. We didn't face much wrath because at the time city was not this much developed. Uh, with a lot of open spaces and all and less buildings. But now things are, situation is different. There's a lot of skyscrapers and all. Well, so it's a very difficult proposition nowadays. So you can see this is a cyclone storm, a radar picture of the same from the Karaikal radar. This is a system which crossed near uh, Marakan near Pondicherry. So the curve uh, band indicates that system is somewhere here closer to Pondicherry. So this picture will show the movement of the clouds during this cyclone storm. You can see uh, piles of uh, water bearing clouds. Uh, you can see the reflectivity scale. This is all in dB is it, decibels. And uh, if it is much more red means the water content is more. This picture north to south as well as east to west uh, gives the height of the clouds. So the 15, 16 meter high kilometers clouds are there here. So it is giving the rain to the city. 
So this is the path of the cloud which crossed. On Chennai, because it moved in the west of Chennai, still it gave good rainfall to the city. And this is a car park area and a complex near Velachery in South Chennai. So the car park itself has been inundated and people have to remove the car and bring it to the road. Nowadays people are taking it to the a bridge where they can safely keep the car and they bring it, bring the car later once this water is removed. That's what many people are doing. So this hydrometallurgical disaster due to heavy rainfall, torrential downpour. So afterwards, now I'm going to discuss synaptic situations leading to heavy rainfall of our Gulf of Manar, systems moving along the coast, Velocity convergence in Arabian Sea systems, I'm going to discuss. What is called a synaptic situation means, see, when you do PhD, when you are, after preparing your thesis, you will prepare a gist of your thesis called the synopsis. Similarly, the weather chart which I am plotting will give you an idea of synopsis of what is likely to happen in the next few days, what is in store for us. So hence it is called a synoptic chart. Hence the word synoptic situation, synopsis. So that's why the word synoptic is used. So we are going to see similar situations. So this is uh, somewhere in 2008, in the November month, there was a system which formed in a Sri Lanka. It is moving towards Karakal. The, the fall, fall of pressure, pressure this is called 24 hours pressure fall. So the maximum pressure fall you can see somewhere near Karakal in the last 24 hours. So precisely we have got the idea that it's going to cross near Karakal. So this is the best indicator to tell where the system is going to cross. So we'll be plotting it hourly values along the coastal stations. What is the pressure raised today? At this time on after 24 hours, what is the pressure now? And what is the fall of pressure? So that is a maximum fall will indicate the place where it is likely to cross and it is something around 3.2 hectopascal millibars. So that is where it is likely to cross. And then these are all some statistics. How much seven hundred got in that weekly rainfall? 415% above the normal and all. So don't bother much about it. This is just to indicate how much quantum it got. And individual stations rainfall you can see. So this is a Karakal radar. Since it crossed Karakal, I am showing this old radar of Karakal. So there it was all recorded. You can see high reflectivity and good, good water content is there. That's why Varathanad 33, Vedavaranyam 33, they are all your districts in your Delta as well as the uh, other, just north of it you have Chidambaram Kadalu district. They have got torrential rainfall. So these some of the places in the uh, Delta districts, Kumbagonam, Thiravar, all these things, they have got a very good rainfall. Only in the northern portion, you will have more rainfall. Why? Because here, north of the center, the winds will be easterlies. So precisely, they will be getting more rainfall. As far south of the place is concerned, it is naturally a rain shadow region due to your western guards because the air has to go to the Arabian Sea and then come back. So you don't have much rainfall activity south relatively. That's why. So the rainfall south of it will be less. Then it moves. Why is this much rainfall? Because it was just coming to go, crossing the Gulf of Manar. Once the stuff is over Gulf of Manar, what happens? The entire Tamil Nadu will be under the uh, easterlies from the sea. You will have a lot of winds coming from the sea. And the moist winds, which will result in a lot of rainfall activity. You have so the eastern guards also abutting it. So strong winds with moist laden winds are coming towards the sea and then uh, hitting the Eastern Guards and leading to heavy rainfall scenario, like that. So, you can have a lot of rainfall activity. 
So the entire thing cannot do it. So another thing in December 17. So you have a lot of rainfall activity. Uh, the troughs over the Gulf of Munnar. So whenever you have a trough of Gulf of Munnar, you can expect good rainfall activity over entire Tamil Nadu with strong rains along the coast, east coast. You can expect. So, so this is a scenario, uh, and then it is also supported by. an upper air circulation which gives added strength as a result now you can see a lot of moist clouds inside tamil nadu and you can see the trough of low the dotted line is your trough so these are all isobars i am not able to have a full circle that's why i am calling it a trough the full circle i will call it a low two circles means depression like that i could not draw a circle only a kink is there so i call it a trough so gulf Uh, trough of Gulf of or Gulf of Munna, as you can see. So it has given a good rainfall in this scenario also. So now, again, I am going to talk about last year, strong the number 2024. When you have a shear line, what is shear line? Is nothing but your intertropical convergence zone, which I discussed at the start of this uh, uh, lecture. So there was a, a deep depression, and then this had 820 hectopascals. This 1.5 kilometer side. What is the wind pattern? We have a circulation here, and another low pressure was forming somewhere in the Andaman Sea and the adjoining Southeast Bay. So if I join all those lines, this is called the shear line, or the trough line, or a shear line. And what, what is the significance of the shear line? North of the shear line, the winds will be easterly. South of the shear line, winds will be coming from the west. So this is your convergence zone or the intertropical convergence zone. So precisely, this is the area where you can expect good rainfall activity. So this is your uh, EMSAT picture, uh, satellite picture. Where I have drawn the uh, shear line or your uh, ITC is there. Precisely, this is the area where I could see a lot of cloud activity too. So they coincide with each other. So the moment you see a shear line, so along the shear line, you just north or south of it, you can certainly give heavy rainfall warning. Absolutely no problem. So if you see that, DGP office received twenty-three centimeters. And then Chennai Nungam Markam 20 centimeters, like that. Himachal Nagar 17 centimeter, Anna University 16, like that. Good rainfall activity you can see in the city. If it crosses 20, you call it an extremely heavy rainfall. Now, I am going to discuss about a system just abutting the, going along the coast. Recently, Australia. There was a lot of uh, rainfall activity in the Queensland province as well as the New South Wales. So this gentleman from the Bureau of Meteorology is explaining what is the scenario likely weather in the next few days. That you can see now. An east coast low is bringing intense rainfall with potentially life-threatening flash flooding for Sydney and parts of the east coast of New South Wales. This will lead to major flooding, possibly to levels that we saw last year. Severe weather warnings coming from just north of Newcastle, down to the Victorian border, including Sydney. The heavy rainfall, as is rainfall with 70 to 120 millimetres within a six-hour period, and locally intense rainfall, that's up to 150 millimetres within that same period. That could develop anywhere within that warning area, so it will be quite localised. So you could see flash flooding in one suburb and the adjacent suburb not seeing so much and missing out on that flash flooding. Damaging winds will become a risk in the sub. An east coast low is bringing. So this is the torrential rainfall. You can see. Uh, the writers in this show. So you can see. A lot of rainfall activity in the New South Wales uh, province and other provinces. Inundating a uh, huge area. 
this year also it's a mild la nina activity is there so uh, of course there's another big topic and you know you have la nina mild la nina you can expect starting in australia but don't think we can't depend much on the chart to you read your uh, analysis skills also and uh, don't think that the chart both all the different models will show the same output the output from two models can be different for example uh, no two model will concur here i am for illustration i am doing shoe models one is a ecm wf model and is a gfs model ecm wf model is from the european center for medium range weather forecast which is which is functioning from reading in england the other is a general forecast system model from america they have given a software to india also and in india also we are using the gf models model this is called general forecast system model see for a system which is crossing near madagascar and going towards mozambique you see this model is showing a, a heavy rainfall activity inside madagascar but not much uh, inside uh, mozambique but not much in madagascar whereas this gfs model is showing lot of rainfall activity in madagascar also so there is a difference the wind flow patterns are same but the predictions uh, this predicts of course the prediction of heavy rainfall inside mozambique is same fine but not uh, in uh, madagascar why because there is many reason variety of reasons it depends upon the quantum of data that goes inside the model second reason the principles of physics that is used inside the model the third depends upon the crunching for the flow point float for floating point operations per second there's the capacity of the computer like there is a variety of reasons so no two computers will be absolutely same this thing there will be occasions in which they may not even predict heavy rainfall at all also but still you should use your hunch the acumen and your forecasting abilities past experience by seeing the wind pattern whether a heavy rainfall is possible or not ahead that's very important so this is a scenario this is on 30th this is the flow pattern see you are not having any weather system of sort big cyclone or anything of sort but you can see uh, this area marked with uh, like this uh, green color which indicates the wind speeds uh, greater than 30 this dark blue navy blue more than 40 nautical miles per hour so here it is less than that less than 20 nautical miles per hour so this indicates what a stronger winds ultimately lay becomes in a weaker wind indicates what lot of moisture is going to accumulate in the, this area so this is what is called the velocity convergence so on 30th uh, what happened was the mylapur dgp saw is reset 24 cm uh, this avadi 23 cm the ramar seen at 21 cm like the different parts of the city experience torrential rainfall heavy to very heavy and one place even extremely heavy one or two places avadi and mailapur so this due to this velocity convergence that is the model never showed that it showed only light to moderate rainfall so what you should do in this scenario even if the model shows a lower value but if there is a velocity convergence see wind speeds are the art of heavy to very heavy if not extremely heavy at least some heavy rainfall can be predicted so here you should use your hunch and see the chart and you don't bother a model is a model it can fail uh, it can fail absolutely no problem it's only a machine 
So we have to use your recommend. That's important. So you can see the cloud bands approaching the region. Now I am going to talk about Arabian Sea systems. So there is a depression somewhere on the seventh to eighth and ninth in Arabian Sea. The Arabian Sea is giving good rainfall in Tamil Nadu. Whereas Bay of Bengal is only nearer to the coast. Why the system in Arabian Sea should give a rainfall in Tamil Nadu? Because, because the system can always draw the air across Tamil Nadu. The moist bay winds will be going towards the system. As a result, the torrential rain will be there. If you take the southwest monsoon, uh, some of the areas like uh, Valparai, Chinnakallar, in uh, the Kwamathur district, uh, then uh, Devala, Naduvattam, uh, like the, the Kodulur Bazaar, these areas will uh, get good rain. When strong westerly winds will be there. Because of uh, strong winds, they are all fest facing a portion of the western guards. Whereas in the other season, not this month's season, only the east facing guard portion will get more rainfall, like Kunur, Barliar, like that. So the system was somewhere here. So it was giving a, it was drawing the moist air from the bay, so leading to heavy rainfall activity. So, so on the eighth uh, November, you can see something around 19 centimeters. This was actually plotted in millimeters, converted to centimeter. 19 in Kurno, 21 in KT, like that. Uh, the next day, eighth November, KT 14 centimeters, UT 18 centimeters, like that. It is the orientation of the hill, the storm winds, the direction in which it comes. All these matters. So that's why you have a, a change in the wind direction. Uh, if there is that, then the quantum of rainfall also varies. Whereas on 10th November, you had 82 centimeter of rain in Kethi. Highest rainfall recorded ever for Tamil Nadu. So what is in store for the next few days? I'm not seeing much eh, because the bay system is entering the uh, Myanmar and going somewhere. So you will have a light to moderate rain in some subdivisions of Kerala and Karnataka. You can expect. Uh, you can expect not much as far as the other parts of the India is concerned. So, so to summarize the entire thing, hydrometeorological disaster cannot be prevented. The wisdom lies in the reverse to minimize the loss of human life and property with your proactive action. So if you know you uh, Rainfall is bound to come, you just take the thing, the, the, the actual action which you are supposed to take. People in low lying areas, they automatically, the one the warning comes, you move to a safer place with your property, that will be the best thing in that scenario. And uh, switch off the air power lights, all these things, don't go near the water body, all these things are very, very, very important. So, uh, proactive measures. So, and uh, after some time, we should become a business as usual. With this, uh, I thank you one and all for being attentive to my lecture. And I'm, uh, I'll be willing to answer one or two questions which you can post to me regarding this uh, disasters, if possible. Any questions? No question. So, I can finish up, isn't it? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, I have one question. Oh, please, please, please. What is the civic authorities planning, sir, in, in order to prevent the accumulation, sir? Uh, to construct a house in the lake area, it is bound to order to find this one. Hour. So, the best is storm drain should be cleared. So that the water should not be blocked in the storm drain. And ultimately it should go to the lake. That is my very, very important. And even as uh, for the sewerage water is concerned, you treat it. Sir. And treated water should go to the river and lakes. So that the water level in the city is maintained. 
uh, even in Thames, they let out the treated rainwater. Instead of drains joining the sea or a lake or a river, it should be the treated water which should be go. Because your water level will be maintained. So drought will be minimized. So that is how we should look at the perspective. And then the main road should be at a higher level. The side road will be at a gradient. So that the water finds its own level and, and to the ultimately to the water body. That is how it has become uh, constructed. So, so these are the planning and then uh, as far as the big buildings are concerned, what they should do is <coughs> a good part of the land for creating a pond and they should treat the water and put the treated water in the pond. Similarly, during heavy rains, the, it can store a lot of water. Similarly, if you are having a pond, half the pond you make it into a lake. Okay. So that heavy water, heavy flow is there. Naturally, it finds its lower level. And it is only the subways which has helped the city. Because heavy water has gone to that subways. So we, those areas which are having subways, they have been saved because of those subways. That's how we have to see in that perspective. Thank you, sir. It's very really interesting and we thoroughly enjoy. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Oh. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, you have given climatic factors and hydrometeorological disaster causes and its management from our rain man. Thank you again, sir. With this, we conclude the morning session and it's time for lunch break. The afternoon session will start by 2 p.m. So the participants are requested to join by 2 o'clock. Thank you to all the participants and to the guests. Thank, thank you, sir. sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, so useful and sir. Sir, uh, excellent, sir. Excellent. Thank you, Pranav. Sir, now questions can I have or any question? Which one? Yar, care in which area? The garden is not. Can I have one? Tell me. Students, students, can you? Nariya, care in which area, sir? Oh, sir, oh, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, now we call Pranav. Now we meet Pranav. Ah, one more time. Come here. 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 Uh, participants, uh, feedback will be yeah. feedback form will be sent to you by the afternoon session only. Uh. So kindly, uh, now this is the lunch break. So connect with us by the afternoon session. Right. You see the maximum time set. It is hardly three three and a half meters only. So you won't be inundated uh, much. That's the thing. Uh, unlike your Ramesh Rao or uh, your uh, twenty four burgers of Bangladesh, they are almost at sea level. Sea level twenty four burgers. Sir, I'm talking about Bangladesh as well as your Madina Port district. Madina. Similarly, Ramesh Rao in Tamil Nadu. Means the level is same. The same. Same to the ground. The same as this. Chennai is it? Chennai is a little bathymetry is more. So you won't have much problem comparing with those two places. That's it.
Sir, good afternoon, sir. Sir, I'm director, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, one come. One come, sir. Take it, sir. Take it, sir. One come, one come, one come. Thank you. You know, you know, sir. Parga, sir, parga. One come, sir. Sir, one come, one come, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. One come, sir. One come, sir. Very good afternoon. Professor Kitsumuti. Yeah, master. Yes, yes, yes. 
Good afternoon. Shall we start, sir? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Uh, come on. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Now we'll start the afternoon session. Uh, let me start the inaugural address by Dr. R. R. Krishnamurti, sir. Over to you, sir. Very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, um, I feel very happy to be part of this uh, one-day uh, workshop on disaster management that is being conducted by the uh, Center for Water Source Management, University of Madras. And I think the disaster management in today's perspective is very, very important and different. We are all witnessing the change in the scenario, especially in the community-based disaster management in the post-pandemic period. And we have a very wonderful resource person from morning to this evening uh, to address the participants and the different interrelated topics. And technology-related aspects uh, would have covered by Professor Ganabadi in the forenoon. And uh, in the afternoon, we have a, a person, resource person, uh, uh, Professor Suresh Maria Salvo. He is a community-based uh, disaster management person. And he has very vast knowledge in the field. He knows that the present challenges um, moving towards the community-based disaster management, especially in the post-pandemic situation. And we have associated uh, uh, during the last uh, uh, couple of years, especially in the pandemic period, to conduct a series of workshops under this title for the different target groups, including our own uh, uh, postgraduate students, that is MSc Applied Geology students, they, under, they have participated in the different webinar topics uh, related to the, under the umbrella of sustainable development. And uh, this present day uh, workshop is definitely will be beneficial to the participants and to understand this, uh, the current challenges in the field of community-based disaster management. And uh, I formally welcome Professor Suresh Maria Salvam to engage the participants and to share the participants the uh, real-time challenges, especially the post-pandemic situation, how we are facing the, uh, um, you know, what is it, the uh, situation like uh, flood and other disasters. Now we are uh, coming to the another phase of heat waves and how these are all going to impact the uh, vulnerable community. And already we are facing the problem of the pandemic situation, bouncing back from the pandemic. And uh, we are having a little bit of breathing time. And uh, this uh, morning uh, news shows that there is another variant is, is coming up, but we don't know what will happen, what will be the impact of the next COVID-19 variant. And the community should be prepared for the pandemic situation as well as to the disaster situation. The disaster is, uh, is again, you can see that there is uh, um, the, both the chronic disaster as well as the episodic disaster that are happening across the world. And uh, we have uh, recently heard about that earthquake and tsunami that happened in Japan. And then now the several parts of the country is facing the heat wave and how we are going to manage the situation. Though we had a very good rainfall during the northeast monsoon, now we can witness with the impact of heat waves. So how the community is going to face this challenging situation, there is one time flood and next, immediately after a few months, we are having the heat waves, the change in the climatic pattern, rainfall pattern, all these things. And uh, this is a really a uh, uh, wonderful occasion to disseminate the information to the uh, different uh, target groups, including the faculty there. Teaching. Maybe you can inject a different, the whatever the information you receive from the resource person to the uh, uh, students. When you handle the students in the classroom level, offline uh, mode of teaching. Now we are um, back to offline mode and uh, the students also in, in uh, uh, seeing a different scenario after the two years of uh, different different situation online offline and majority of the time they were engaged in our online mode now we are uh, engaging them in uh, offline mode so uh, how to 
um, faced with this kind of challenges and uh, the challenges are uh, no limit and we have to bounce back and uh, it is certainly the resource person like professor maria selva they will they have a very vast uh, experience and knowledge in this particular domain so uh, it is very very appropriate to listen to this kind of uh, resource person um, on this kind of situation now i um, request uh, the organizers to hand over the session to professor suresh marishan thank you very much thank you professor vishnumuthi uh, thank you sir for your valuable time with us and i would like to invite suresh mariyasulam sir and he having the experience in industry and society development sectors and eight years in academia teaching in humanities and management subjects and he played a key role in strategic management of public health in india by introducing computerized health information system for health and family research and he trained all district administrators and ngos in community based disaster risk reduction and mainstreaming of disaster risk reduction into developmental planning strategies using sdgs for tamil nadu and are also prepared guidelines and play tips for school safety and promoting multidisciplinary approach on community development strategies for medical engineering and management students and scholars thank you sir and over to you sir thank you thank you so much am i audible yes sir oh, thank you so much yeah um excuse me for my uh, delayed response actually i am in part of a uh, national summit at srm university on uh, menstrual hygiene and management motherhood focused uh, uh, seminar uh, it's a national seminar and we have guests from all over the country and uh, so it may look it, it's related to the public health but, but actually if you look at it menstrual hygiene is a problem for an adolescent girl practically if you look at it uh, as long as we are inside the campus we have our syllabus and we have our responsibility to complete the portion and then and then conduct the exams and give the research and something like that when we go to the field it's totally different last year i took uh, from a college almost 60 to students uh, those are social students to look at where i had an opportunity i spoke to the management also i made them to sit with the community to discuss with them to understand their problems and how much their knowledge their uh, uh, experience from their community uh, they could help the i mean uh, community members and and understand their problems so it was half day uh, the community members explained their problems and half day the students responded and then they also learned and they also taught something it was a wonderful uh, experience for them to to have a first stand information from the community and to my surprise a couple of days back i received a mail from from the principal out of the 64 students almost 28 students are appearing for the upsc exam so uh, they are appearing for the ias exam because i gave a topic to them that day is be the system and change the system so this is what is expected out of any seminar what we talk about uh and then that should end up with some kind of a uh, result in the youngsters among the youngsters who are the national builders and they are going to take over because it's uh, it's a time for us to, to uh, pass on whatever the experience we have gathered and and already they have the technology in their hand now it's our uh, responsibility to to link the experiences and the lessons learned the good practices to the technology and try to make it Uh, as much as possible for the community to have a resilience in the years to come. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, let me start my presentation on community-based disaster management. Before that, I would make you to understand one thing. There are two kind of responses. One is active response and one is passive response. See, government is there. It's a machinery. It has got uh, 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 infrastructure, legal infrastructure. It has got a uh, assembly. It has got a uh, Lok Sabha. It has got members are there, representatives, and they go, go through the situation and they come out with the solution as we debate it and become the policy, and then they follow it. It's, it's all systematically is happening. But certain things beyond the uh, procedures, what they follow in the uh, Lok Sabha or the assembly, uh, certain things happen. Uh, for example, when tsunami struck us, we never heard about tsunami, and there was a lot of uh, 
huge uh, human laws and uh, property laws, economic laws. But there was no policy to do. After that, see how many policies have come, including the coastal regulation zone, uh, rehabilitation uh, packages, and so many things. So every time we learn lessons. But other than that, what we have to understand is there is a role for everyone to play in a disaster management. Disaster is not a thing just like it happens over there. It's an unexpected thing happens. So everyone has got a role to play. When government does something, the, the first responders are the people who are vulnerable to the disaster. They should also be little prepared and they should have some kind of knowledge about the geopolitical factors around them and their own capacity and how they can help each other till the help reaches them. Because immediately government cannot start taking the measures. It has got its own time and uh, resolution has to be taken, decisions have to be taken. And, and uh, even if it is a 24 hours uh, fast response uh, system, but still we have a uh, uh, time break. So till then the community should be prepared. How we can make the community prepared, that's what we are going to see and discuss about it. Maybe from my experience I'm sharing, we can also share your experiences which will end this session today. Thank you very much. I will start with the presentation. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. So let me stop step step by step. So we are talking about active response and passive response. Active response is when a warning is given and the community is well prepared and well sensitized and they respond to that. So if they have to respond, I mean they have to evacuate. When they are prepared immediately with the materials what they can carry. So the damages will be very less. That's an active response. Passive response is government reaching everyone's door asking, are you in trouble? Please come. I'll take care. So it will take so much time for the government to decide how to handle each sector or each section of a community. Because the community consists of children, angels, uh, women, pregnant women, uh, marginalized community like disabled, disabled people, the elderly people, sick people. So we cannot have separate packages. The community should be well prepared to take care of themselves by understanding the capacity what they have and the geo uh, political data and the demographic data of them. If they are prepared with that, as soon as the warning is given, 90% of the problems will get solved. So how we can start? The first thing is the disaster is in a race. After 1995, to look at it, the frequency of disasters are increasing. Uh, earlier it was once in two years or three years, and then the government used to give a relief. So that was a practice. But after 95, especially, uh, we'll see the reason why it was. The, the frequency of disasters are increasing. So I personally feel the first uh, major disaster which I encountered was 1999 super cyclone. When I was working, I was not in the disaster management. I was working for uh, uh, develop. I was in the development sector with Jagdani, the Danish International Development Assistance, working for uh, public health uh, projects promotion. So I was working with uh, six states, and I was in Odisha also. Uh, so I had an opportunity to to provide some relief materials uh, during this super cyclone and then 2011 or in 2001 uh, earthquake also uh, we were in Bhuj but we are not allowed to enter inside being uh, that time I was with UN office uh, UNFPA but we are not allowed for protocol uh, safety protocols because the first day the clearance of debris was a big challenge and second day third day when we were prepared again the rats came out of the houses the, all the complete uh, devastation of this debris, the rats started running here and there, and there was a threat of a plague spreading on the front. So, we are not allowed to enter the field again. So, one week without doing anything or sitting alone, we just want to do an analysis only based on the ground data, what was collected by the NGOs, only that, that only we could make use of it. So, every time that's a kind of a situation where it was like a war situation and it needs a complete preparedness 
uh, and uh, the response system to be on the uh, on the field. Otherwise, it will make the situation more confusing, and then it may lead to some other uh, problems also. So, if you look at the development part, one side maybe the you can take the example of Tamil Nadu. It's well uh, developed. We have seen uh, the, the uh, online procedure and online education and electricity, uh, transport, uh, road network, rail network, business community, movements and everything. This is one side they are much, much, much ahead of many other states. On the other hand, if you look at it, this is a, this is a village I have taken from Riga. They don't have electricity, the village. See, if you have to call somebody, I have to bring this bell here. This, this is the situation over there. So there is no electricity. So you can think about how they are going to reach to our level. It will take another 50 years for them to uh, come uh, equal into our way of handling the financial services online. So that's that's a disparity we are still having this country. So what we can do is we can only do the interventions by providing um, the right kind of intervention to the right kind of uh, uh, first responders. That's the only thing we can do. For that, the disaster management last mile connectivity is such an experience. It teaches how social, political, and cultural values in our community resilience, technology and innovation, and how these in turn affect society, environment, and politics. So they have their own practices. In the community, they have their own uh, anthropology covers all this. So it has got its own um, festivals and, uh, and, and customs and, and practices. So, so we cannot have a standard package for every community, especially a country like India, where we have multi ethnic and multicultural, multilingual, multi religious, multi class. That's the biggest challenge. But still, that's the biggest uh, blessing also to learn a lot of things which most other countries uh, do not have an opportunity. So, so, even that's what I'm saying, even if I, if I uh, done my uh, master's in abroad, in fact, the lessons what I learned from India was much, much. Uh, uh, very useful experience than the lessons what I learned academically from the European universities because they saw based on uh, developing country case studies. So, so we should be very thankful that we have challenges, we have problems, but we have the technology with us, we have the education with us, we have the experience with us, we have the capacity to understand and find a solution. So, this is a picture of uh, an island and toilet. Uh, so, which was, uh, this, this picture was taken, I think it was in 2004, it's, uh, just before the tsunami. And this uh, uh, this island is uh, completely depends on, on tourism, that is all water gave them, and uh, villas and, and uh, cottages where uh, people have to book at least minimum three months earlier. So, you can see that, look at the island, it's so beautiful. But one thing is, they were not uh, aware of what kind of uh, vulnerability uh, they had before tsunami. So this was the picture. Uh, immediately, I think within half an hour, uh, one hour, uh, the picture taken by satellite picture of the tsunami. You see that uh, there was no connectivity over here. This was completely frozen. This is a one-way way. Uh, people can move. Because this was very vulnerable on the water. Maybe a creek or something like that. So the main evacuation route only was this route was only evacuation. So by the time all three, four sides, uh, the waves came inside and they devastated. This is an example. So why, why, how all this, all of a sudden, it's all happening. But till 18th century, we'll go a little backward. Till 18th century, the living style of the people all over the world, it was something like Whatever was available at geopolitical area, it could be for uh, clothing, could be for uh, food uh, cooking, or it is for the lifestyle. Everything is based on the climate, based on the geopolitical factors, based on the soil, the things were available. So people also made use of it accordingly. And then like like you know, the uh, cold areas, chill areas, so all woolen products were sold and it was available. And if it is a tropical area, it's all cotton based clothing and then rice and that kind of thing. So it was like that till 18th century. The first intervention started when 
steam was introduced or steam was invented that it could be mechanized uh, the human way of doing things uh, it can it can automate the things by using steam so that was introduced in hand looms that was introduced in power tools that was introduced in transport but steam engines and uh, the ships steam ships and buses and trucks and so now people started moving from their place where they are living to nearby places or little far ahead of it where they were not used to it and they find there is a possibility of selling their products there or getting something from there to their land that's how this invasion started first thing is earlier it was there but not to that extent of after an invention of the first industrial revolution after the steam uh, the second revolution started after the electricity was introduced in the, the early uh, 20th century where more automation was done the electricity to be used to run in industries and and uh, industrial policies came because the industrial policy the worker policy the workers policy the insurance policies and then insurance laws and and uh, so many management things started coming up and it was getting streamlined and so more productivity more things uh, more innovation more research and then now they have been looking for markets now capturing market started and from one place to another place and, and in 1960 the third revolution on digital revolution started where the uh, most of the mechanical things which was heavy uh, occupying so much space was completely compressed into small spaces into the digital uh, introduction and that led to a lot of it, uh, a lot of automated systems to take care of the industries the robots were introduced so that led to uh, globalization because the developed countries started thinking about two ways one is they wanted to sell the products in the developing country and then acquire as much as uh, finances from that number two to have their manufacturing units in the developing countries where labor is cheap land is cheap all the resources and local resources everything is cheap manufacture there and sell it to the big developed countries for higher profit so that kind of this thing so what's that uh, industrial revolution of uh, digitized uh, uh, industrial revolution started then robotics uh, was really thing most of the industries might have seen all control by the robots and uh, so the human job to find out some other uh, uh, life uh, style and now the production is happening for a country for example you take in that and that is from korea but they have their units in, in manufacturing plant in chennai and say another country having a plant here and they are selling in europe so now it's a globalization really took place now one side you look at the rich become more richer and and poor become poor poorer in the process what has happened exploitation of nature started because they wanted to use a paper they wanted to use a furniture they wanted lifestyle changed and the globalization changed food styles changed american food came inside here yeah, from here something else so the entire uh, uh, systematic lifestyle what we have been talking about in mid 16th 17th centuries totally changed that was the first line of uh, a person was become vulnerable to kind of uh, hazards and the last one what we are living now is artificial intelligence area now more than us even though we have the most powerful computer called the brain which even we cannot think about so much of information what the spectras and spectras we are talking about computers that 100 and 200 300 500 thousand times faster sorry uh, storage is available but needs practice of storing it and then getting it back information but we are using only two to three percent of our brain and mostly we depend on machines we depend on other things so now uh, artificial intelligence uh, is now taking over as controller uh, to give a frank example the face now your system identifies you with your finger uh, print or uh, with your face and the uh, practical point if you look at it china last time when i visited i can see the cameras over there on the, on the uh, traffic signal and if any person violates immediately the face recognition uh, software identifies the face and then connect with the with the uh, citizen number and before you could cross the zebra line you get this chalan on this uh, main point uh, chalan so that kind of uh, uh, lifestyle we are moving towards that so globalization one way has given a lot of jobs for the people who work but other way around we have a uh, bitter experience of uh, disasters due to exploitation of uh, nature uh, our environment uh, climate change uh, and other socio economic uh, practice so what happened was it's 
those four uh, uh, industrial revolutions, we have electricity, we've got petroleum, automobile, airlines, and water supply, distribution, modern electronics, all this thing. And banking economy on the other side, and medical pharmacy, life expectancies increased. You know, the people are living for 70, 80 years, but at the age of 40, so they started getting diseases. They live, but they live with the diseases. And then the pharma industry plays a major role in selling. Now, COVID is the biggest uh, uh, example. Uh, all of a sudden, we are being, you know, without knowing what. We have been asked to wear a mask and then you know, social distancing and then keeping ourselves inside the house, locking ourselves so that the transmission was quite high and was uh, transmitting to the passengers or, or the people who are traveling. And all the airports were closed and so many things happened. So we had a tough time the last two years and then uh, as a solution they said take a uh, vaccine. Now they are saying vaccine uh, loses its uh, power so every time you have to boost up so you have to boost up you have to something like that. Till the clinical trial is going on, RNA based uh, so we don't know. So every time one side technology goes, the other side that is having an uh, equivalent uh, technology failure also the other side. So in that process, what happens is people become very comfortable who are walking and using uh, cars and bullock cars and all of a sudden now we are traveling in fast jets. So now the life expectancy increases and, and the communities earlier were joint families, now it's all nuclear families and uh, so the population from the mid of uh, 19th century onwards started raising up because of the uh, technology developments, life became easier. So the, the, the families started having more members in the family. But this will go up to 2100. Now we started realizing that even though technology is supporting us, but other factors are getting depleted. So now it's time for us to control our population and then try to keep it just balance. So it will start only from 2050 onwards probably will come to the straight line maybe of 100. So because of this population increase one side and this uh, uh, migration of people from one place to another place for jobs or for materials or for any kind of business purpose. So there is a lot of uh, changes happening around us and that was leading to some kind of disaster. So these are the list of the uh, reported natural disasters by type, mostly by flex because of the climate change was the biggest change. So the major disasters we faced in the whole world was flex was it's of the extreme weather. Now Mr. Krishna was talking about that earlier it was flux, now it's going to be all heat waves are going to have uh, its own impact on us. And the drought one side is flooded and the other side is drought and then extreme temperatures, earthquake, landslides, wildfires and volcanic activity. And more than that mass movement of people. And that can be us during this uh, uh, COVID time when people do not get there. Uh, transport to reach their places, they have walked uh, 1000 kilometers, more than 1000 kilometers. They walk. Now, see this after this uh, uh, 1990 onwards, when the developing countries they found out they are spending so much of money on only relief, then the entire uh, international community sat together. 1990 onwards, they are started working on it, and then they came to the conclusion that we have to identify the root cause of the problem. And then we have to segregate the disasters into different categories and then identify what is the root cause of it and then we should try to prevent it uh, that giving just a relief because earlier it was one or two times but now there's almost two three disasters every year that will have a big hole in the budget so now they are thinking about and the UN did a, a study in research and then they came out of the uh, research finding saying that one dollar spent on preparedness will save seven dollars uh, budgeted for relief and rehabilitation. That's, that's a very uh, comprehensive study. Uh, they studied because if people are prepared, the warning is given and being taken to some other place and economically they have been very settled. The job is, they can see for example, connected. In a such a way, they had better jobs, the livelihood is better, they have a better health seeking behavior, they have a better living style, they have a better living places. Where the poverty is the major problem. Poverty elevation is that's why most of the programs are working on the poverty elevation and, and developing countries are, are fighting against it. So these are the major disasters we had in the last uh, years. The impact is mostly so the area is 135.79 million square kilometers uh, the world surface we are occupying. We are covered with uh, uh, mountains on side and uh, oceans and three side. Always the highly cold earthquakes, landslides, endogenetic. Already, this giving 
once it was flooded, now it is slowly it is. Yesterday also I was talking to someone who is in the Kandipik uh, play. They say now uh, we have to say one, we are lost to Saraswati. There is a river called Saraswati. We, we, I am not ever seen. I heard about that. Ganga is there, Saraswati, Yamuna is but still it's, it's, it's going on. It was not very uh, uh, flooded or, or, or completely uh, flowing the way it was uh, what it was in 50 years ago. So either it will be flooded or it will be river bed sun dry. So it is obvious that we have to do that. The northwestern part, road to drought also. And then uh, the country is susceptible to types of all kinds of disasters. Uh, Droughts and floods and cyclones and tsunamis, landslides, avalanches, precipitation, forest fires. These are all natural hazards. Other, other than that, uh, 70 percent area is drought prone, 60 percent earthquake prone, 1 percent flood prone. For all, you can get it from the National Disaster Management Authority uh, websites. All the information. There were different kinds of disasters between 1980 and 2015. We have faced. Um, Samples. And uh, the 10 countries which have uh, top 10 countries with most disasters and the equivalent amount they are spending. Uh, first one is always China. China has got uh, 286 disasters that they are spending is on 265 million dollars. Whereas India is concerned, it's equivalently 212, but we have spent so much of money because the preparation and awareness is very less and we have spent so much. This is from 2005 to 2014 onwards. And then in, in, in other countries, if you look at it, highest again is Japan. They had uh, 60, only 62 disasters, but major, all of tsunamis and earthquakes and volcanoes. So the kind of amount they have spent, 239 uh, million dollars, which is uh, a huge amount for a country like But still, but still, they have uh, well prepared uh, human resources. And then, so somehow, because of that, they could manage. Otherwise, it is like uh, lethargic movements over the. Japan would have been uh, completely uh, disappeared. Thank you. Still. So these are some of the examples of how we handle uh, prior to uh, prior to independence. The myself for men, people were left behind without giving the Britishers were not very particular about taking care of them. And then uh, they are uh, the people who are affected by health issues, they were all kept in separate places and closed down. And uh, those who are healthy, those who are surviving, uh, elderly people are kept separately and then youngsters uh, are supposed to go and work in the field, earn something and then that money was shared with the elders. That kind of really population. So this is a picture after the independence of Bengal for me, where uh, the food, what a father thought is only uh, enough for a child, so he is sitting in the building, so that kind of mechanism was happening. So other than that, I would like to share this picture about uh, I don't know how many have heard about this story. This is about a, a photographer called uh, Kevin Carter, another well uh, known photographer. The gentleman, uh, why I am giving the example is many of us, including myself, till uh, mid 90s, we know about our job, we know what we are doing, we know about our work, and then we completely sink in only into that world. Beyond that, we never look at it. Even though if something happens, which others say that's very dangerous, we may not know the impact of that. Here also the story happens like that. The tsunami, sorry, um, Somalia is one of the most affected areas because of this uh, nuclear waste was dumped over the coastal side of the marine. The sources were completely uh, depleted because of this uh, nuclear waste. And uh, second thing is because of this uh, civil war situation, civil war situation in Africa. Um, people could not uh, you know, look into development like that because major budget was on, 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 on arms because they are spending so much of their budget on uh, buying arms and civil wars. So there was a lot of uh, uh, health issues, there were a lot of poverty related issues. Look at this child is about to die and the vulture is sitting next to it and then waiting for the child to die. So this man did, took this photograph and sent it to Pulcher Award and he got the award also. But later, when his friends and, and, and his well wishes uh, met him, he said, they, they said uh, my friend, this is this is a, a very nice picture, he got the award. But at least he could have saved the child, he could have, he could have chased out that vulture and he could have saved the child. But he never thought about it. 
because for him this profession was very important and then, uh, so, so he was happy about it. Many of us, uh, I was also like that till 1995, I was happy with working. But later when I started working with community, uh, especially on leprosy and tuberculosis, they were marginalized and the kind of stigma they were facing, then I realized that something we have to give back to society. That's how, how the journey started. So, so here also the thing happened and then, then that time we realized that yes, I have saved the child. Why? Why that? He was like me. And that was a question uh, made him to think twice and thrice a hundred times and finally it became a guilt uh, feeling for him and then after three or four months he came to the So this is the story about this gentleman. So why I'm saying though that this kind of warnings are given, warnings are given by various agencies. Now sea level is increasing. Uh, 2019 was the warmest year. The ocean heat is also a major threat now. Greenhouse gas uh, reach new heights, and, and uh, because of that, uh, the heat is increasing. The ozone has a layer, and the ozone layer has a hole. In the warmest four years, last 2005 onwards, and Arctic and Antarctic sea ice will be uh, below average. These are the warnings given by the World Meteorological Department. In India, also, if you look at it, these are the areas you cannot predict anything of uh, heat waves and these blue ones are all these are the areas, the study areas which cannot predict about threats any time. Last year, 2015 we had a threat in Chennai and then followed by 2018 there was a threat in Kerala. Last year there was in Karnataka, again there was a threat in this year. That's because of different reasons but still, you cannot, you cannot predict any time what time you know, Orissa is well known for it. I have seen that Mahana the river one every year, either it will be dry completely or it will be beyond the bridges and PR also. So these are all uh, the plains uh, which are in the uh, path of uh, major rivers. So whenever this flooded, the entire landscape uh, gets affected. So now we must understand, uh, till now we have seen the background of disaster. Now it's time for us to look into uh, somebody, some, some resource person but a cowardice, but quickly that's why I'm, I'm just touching it. Before going into the subject, you must understand the definition very clearly, uh, even though uh, you would have heard about it, but still I just want to touch it over there. There are three things you should understand. One is an hazard, and one is uh, the vulnerability, and one is uh, uh, the hazard losing its control and uh, becomes a, uh, a problem and then if we are not prepared, it becomes a problem. Yeah. So, uh, if you have the capacity to face it, for example, you can look at it, I'll give a live example also on this, but just uh, based on that, I have taken these pictures. And this is an answer, this is, this is a rock, but you might have seen a rock near Mahavi Grounds on the bottom of the there. Many people try to pull it over there, even though it is hanging with one small stone stuck at the bottom, but even 100 people try to push it over, it doesn't. But we don't know, even a small shake in the earth could, could, could roll it up, we don't know. But still, people are living over there, people are visiting there, that's a tourist spot. The person here is sitting over there. But they have got a fence like this. That's a fence over there. And that, that's a prevention. Beyond that, the, 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 the huge impact of that the rolling of the, the, the stone would be great also. But still, it can reduce the impact. That's a prevention. So, here is some hazard. Hazard is nothing but the definition says any object or situation or behavior that has the potential to cause injury any health or damage to life, property or environment, anything while walking, uh, if, if, if you are not very uh, attentive to, to the door and you are uh, a person who is tall, if it doesn't look it over, there is a possibility you may get hit on the, on the forehead. That's an, that's another. So, you should prepare or somebody has to tell it. So, better you bow down and watch because it's not very low. Either they should have the capacity to look at it or somebody has to tell them. So that's a wonder for uh, us beyond that. I agree with you about the uh, so, so any object or a situation or behavior that has a potential to cause injury in that area, if it is possible, right? well, driving the bus or while driving the vehicle, even though I am going the right path, there is a possibility somebody else coming on the front side may lose the control of the company. That is, I always look into something is going to happen and I can get with it. Uh, uh, many people, you see, they'll be holding the brake all the time. So, Right. That kind of fear will be obvious. So that's about hazard. Hazard is any time it could happen to anybody else. And as long as it doesn't affect uh, individual or an immunity, it's okay. It becomes an hazard. 
but when it causes something because it loses the control. Now, in this case, we look at it if uh, there's an exposure, this, this person is standing here, it's a tourist, for example, and then he's exposed to that hazard. Anytime you can roll down, and if that rolls down and the prevention does not control it, he may be having an injury or something like that. So, threats, when there are no particular measures taken, people may be affected by malaria if there are no protected from mosquitoes. So, water bodies, when water stagnation happens, there is a possibility the mosquito is going to start. So, no exposure. Like from the water, what kind of impact it can create on the body? But the person diminishes capacity. So that's a more vulnerable situation. So and then capacity measures is so when somebody tells you that the stone is rolling or or some kind of a, a warning is given, so then the person can run away from that place. That that's a he has got capacity to make someone to shout for him and then to run away from the place. Okay, so that's about preparedness. And then, then comes uh, mitigation. Is even I don't have anybody to warn me, or I cannot run, but I make a uh, house in such a way that even something over there can reduce the impact. Now, he, this man is sitting in a cave, so it is even rolls over there, it's not going to affect him. That's actually will reduce the impact of the disaster. So, that's called mitigation. Uh, so, the, the action of reducing the severity, seriousness, and refers to measures taken to reduce the harmful effects of the hazards. So, beyond that, something happens. Then so the, the definition is disasters result from combination of hazards. A hazard uh, need not be a disaster. A hazard could be either prevented or it will just pass away without affecting us. Okay. So so hazard need not be a disaster. But when the hazard, if, if the vulnerability is not understood and the capacity is not there and it is affecting us and then we are facing it, we don't have a capacity to face it. We don't have the world, I mean, we don't understand the world, then it becomes a disaster. That's whatever capacity I have beyond that, if that affects me and if it causes me some kind of a loss in my personal thing, then it becomes a disaster. But disaster is self from the combination of hazards, conditions of vulnerability, and beyond the capacity of measures to reduce the potential negative consequences of this. Now, look at this. Uh, this is a, a classic example uh, of what we discussed just now. Uh, if, if, if you don't hear the audio, please tell me. Oh, good day, good day. from uh, Kuno happened last year, all of a sudden started rolling, somebody shouted and this man who came in the two-wheeler, he escaped out of it. So, so this is what I was talking about, it's a risk, I mean, uh, how to measure a risk, how to expect, how to be prepared, first we must understand what kind of risk we are vulnerable to, where we are living. For example, take Chennai, we are vulnerable to tsunamis, floods, earthquake, um, it could be of uh, lightning, thunder. Okay. So each risk we can take it. And then we should understand hazard. When the lightning could be there, when the monsoon happens. Sometimes it could be out of the monsoon season also, but usually it's on the monsoon. So when the monsoon is approaching, we should be prepared to face the situation of lightning uh, avoid going out or lightning we are outside, then what are the precautions we have to do? So if it is as uh, summer is approaching now, presentation was talking about leaf waves already started. So that's an hazard. The vulnerabilities we'll have skin diseases, we'll have uh, intestinal problems, we will have uh, dust, dust related, water related, water bodies, which are water level of the body, we can suck up that we get key based uh, diseases. So these are the vulnerable situations. So capacities, so either you can stay back at home or if you are going out carrying the water bottle or always take some fruits which can add the water. Uh, and that inside and keep the body with uh, enough uh, water level. So, so this is the uh, formula of it. So, risk the level of the risk is equal to the hazard which could happen or the probable hazard in that place multiplied by vulnerability based on if it is 3 liter of an earthquake 
then you have one of the little less. If it is five, it will be little high. Seven, it will be more high. And seven and all that is too much. So when the warning is given that there is a, a earthquake in, in the Bay of Bengal at the 5.5 Richter level, that's that's uh, alarming level. So definitely we should be alert and then keep ready to. Uh, listen to the, the government warning and then act upon it. So the vulnerable understanding the vulnerability and then the capacity. Yes, I can immediately evacuate before the government is sending the buses. I can keep ready with my documents, which are very important for me, like passport, uh, certificates, and some money and and some valuable things. And I can keep it and keep ready. The moment the bus reaches, then I can immediately escape out of it. So the capacity is there. Naturally, the risk level will be very less. But the other way around, they don't understand the probable hazards. Or how much it can cause a vulnerable situation, and what kind of capacity is required if they don't have the natural risk will be quite high. If you understand this, the entire concept of disaster management is, and every time you can look at it, what kind of hazard, how much it can create a vulnerability, and what kind of capacity. So hazard to vulnerability divided by the capacity will give you the level of risk. So we call it as pre-disaster during disaster conflicts. So this is pre-disaster situation. We need to go for prevention by understanding the risk. We should go for preparedness by understanding the, the, the disaster impact from the past history and then mitigation to reduce the impact. I give a small example. Um, traffic signals are good. so that that's a prevention. That's a prevention. That's to regulate the traffic and then uh, we have to obey to that. And then preparedness is. Keep uh, the first aid box in the vehicle always. That's a preparedness. Even something happened, doesn't happen, but we are keeping something that prepared. Mitigation is even uh, accident happens and uh, the first aid box is available. And even if it is not you know, expired medicines or something like that, we are always keeping a standby one. It's always reducing. That is about pre disaster. This is during disaster. After disaster, is immediately rescuing the people, giving them relief. Providing the rehabilitation for the people who are affected. That's a post disaster situation. So, the company covering all this thing, what we discussed till now, disaster risk is considered as a combination of severity and frequency of a hazard. Severity and frequency. That's severity is what is the level? If it is an earthquake, we measure it on Richter's. If it is a uh, cyclone, we calculate the speed of the wind. If it's a flood, we calculate how much water level it is. The severity is based on the measures what we have for each and every hazard. And frequency in a hazard, how frequently it comes. We have two things. Frequently means in a year it comes once in a while, once in a while it's fine. But more than once, twice, thrice, four times it has come. The frequency of the hazard. The number of people, assets exposed to that hazard, and they're vulnerable to damage. This is the definition given by United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Risk. So if you look at the map, this is based on the agricultural uh, uh, sort of mapping. So the natural variability is here, the pyramid base. So here it is socio-economic process is there. The risk is here, hazards, vulnerability, and exposure. So the risk is so the hazards are understood, vulnerability is also understood. The exposure is uh, reduced by giving a preparedness uh, lesson. The natural risk will be very less. And then the emissions, everything will come to anthropologic climate change, natural variability. But a socio economic process, like socio economic pathways, and adaptation, and mitigation actions are covered. So, this is a cycle that continuously happens. So, the types you look at it uh, uh, geo geophysical, that's earthquake and landslide, anything related to uh, the earth geophysically. So, earthquake, landslide. These are all coming in the geo uh, uh, Hydrogelical is based on the water based, the flat and side These are all hydrological. And biologically, if you look at it, blue, the COVID 19, what we uh, experienced in the last few years. And chemical, nuclear, and radiological, these are all man made or human induced from the industrial hazards. And then war accelerated later, and finally, climate obstacle, that is climate due to climate change or environment. Uh, uh, environment so that's, that's a six types of uh, uh, classification of disasters. 
other way around we put it there are two types one is slow onset and quick onset the slow onset is which has got a time to give a warning and then say the thing whereas quick onset is there's no time immediately it can affect you like lightning or earthquake earthquake also takes a few seconds but that's not enough for anyone so i'm sitting in a room now all of a sudden the building starting to shake now we should immediately work out i should go close to the wall stand on the close the thing and then along the wall we should go out and then move to an uh, open place and then we come here we can get out now we have got chambers and then we have got cabins and cubicles even we cannot walk up so we have to go to the center and all of that so the construction of a building uh, is also for the building also is a concept which is being well appreciated Slow onset and quick onset, and then uh, what, what uh, the experts say is watch, alert, and warn. Watch is some somewhere else happening. It is in Japan or, or in Japan. Just watch what's happening. That's so that after us, uh, alert us. It could happen to us also. Where in another man it is happening. We don't know, but be alert. Don't change the light now because the earth is huge and it is what the resources which man cannot imagine. So alert is just nothing but somewhere nearby happening. We alert and then how how we can see that. Warning means definitely it is going to lead to the early wake. So watch alert warning for the key uh, technologies you must understand. And human life is considered a community life. There are five capitals are there. This is the government, this is a people mean people elected governments are people of a monarchy or a military governor, or whatever it's political. And physical is nothing but the infrastructure, the hospitals and schools and banks and these are all physical structure. Human structure is the human resources who are all ready to work. And financial is oh, financial is investing money <coughs> on various uh, projects. It could be a profit or it could be a loss also. It could be financial loss or it could lead to something like uh, uh, nuclear uh, based or uh, chemical based or chemical uh, hazards also. That's the financial thing. and then natural thing is natural capital. All of these five capitals should be maintained parallel, and then there should be some kind of uh, balance between all the five capitals. If political it is strong, but natural financial is weak. Nothing else. Physical is weak, but human resources is very good. Again, so look at the example of this red one. The natural capital is good. Physical capital is good. Uh, so human capital is little behind because they have resources, they have been exploited. So one group is enjoying, one group is not enjoying. Whereas financially, they are also wealthy. Whereas the government, that's, this is the political, the social political. It's in 60, whereas in 70, it's around 70s. Okay. So, so, so that that you look, at the, look at the blue one. The political is very strong, but whereas the other capitals are very So that will also lead to some kind of disaster. Uh, but to understand that, we should understand the structure of a community. And it's individually we look at it, everyone's age and sex and hereditary factors, maybe brothers and sisters, but each one will have their own hereditary theories. Maybe from maternal mother, paternal father or uncle or somebody else. Each individually, even though there are five brothers or five members in the family, siblings are there, each one will have a different DNA structure. They will not have the same. Kind of age or sex or hereditary or something like that. That's the first level, individual level. Then comes the social and community network. But the family is the, it's the unit. The family is consisting of, the, the group of families consists of community. And within that group, there may be a different caste and different religion, different uh, skills, education level. So that may cause a lifestyle or a living and working condition. Because one can work, both can work in their education employment, I think it's a good tradition. Other way around, unemployment will also happen. What are the solutions? What is satisfaction and, and uh, health services and housing? It may be good or it may be bad. Both sides. So, in that case, what happened? Every individual life is different from other person based on their education and uh, lifestyle. So, based on this theory, if you look at uh, this is the structure of a community. This is, this is the area where we live, this is the internal environment. We move around this place also, get the benefits of the uh, uh, employee, the 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 the
houses. This is, this is outside the houses. And third layer is beyond that. Third layer is the government is going to be called uh, taxes on that. An economic process like the GST or the political and legal forces like uh, uh, the COVID situation. And the last one is technological forces. Now, to give a clear example, when the COVID started, most of the faculty members, teachers, they could not cope up with the technology development of handling uh, uh, online courses because all of a sudden they were forced to work on online courses and, and they, they are not very, they are not uh, computer savvy or computer savvy. So they could not move. So they have to keep somebody next to them and they can. Uh, so that is an impact. So every, every new thing which is coming, either political, economic, social, or uh, legal, uh, or technological thing, we call it a pest. It's a pest, political, economic, and social, and technological factors. Other than that, we have uh, uh, ethical, legal, environmental, democratic. Ethical is certain things have to be done in that particular way, which is not been done. How it is going to be done in that that? Legal uh, ways of uh, solving the problem, environmental factors, and finally, uh, demographic factors we have seen over there. Now, this demographic factor will look at it, the sec sections of the community like 0 to uh, 15 and 15 to 45, 45 and above, uh, 45 to 60 and 60 and above. So, you look at it, the 14 years age, now it's very high. Uh, we have a lot of uh, youth and elders are less. After some time, this entire youth sector will move to uh, the global uh, elderly sector uh, and the child sector is very small, the number is very less. Now, when they become uh, youngsters, they have to take care of themselves and they have to take care of this huge chunk of elders also. And the government's subsidies will not be uh, very satisfactory. So, that is demographic uh, problem. So, if it is not having a balanced demographic uh, population structure, again, one is high, that time we can enjoy once that moves out. For the next two, three generations, we have to So that's again the problem. Other than that, the cultural social shift that we introduced by uh, the, the localization, so various uh, new aspects. So, if you look at it, we have seen the system or processes there, shocks are, or stressors are the uh, triggering factors, uh, and, and they have this disaster uh, uh, is being well defined. And uh, the exposure is there of the shock, the sensitivity, adaptivity, capacity. Now, how much they have the exposure, how much they have sensitivity, how much the adaptive capacity, it depends on first responders. So, based on this knowledge and information, they can bounce back better than this back. This is called the best way of the uh, The next one is bounce back. But we'll get what we lost. We will not be completely equipped ourselves for the face this situation, but at least we can save but our uh, human resource as well as the properties. Third one is, uh, so we last year, I think that this was done before the previous one. We don't know how to handle that situation. The fourth situation is completely collapse, like Solomon Airlines or AT. So these are the agencies which uh, completely collapsed and they could not, even that recent to the payroll, uh, there was 30,000 ton of uh, camphor on board and uh, some 8 to 10 ships are on board and, and then that was the biggest uh, tragedy happened in Bay. So, four things bouncing back better, better than the level what we did earlier. Now to bounce back, just come back and then whatever we left over lying as it is, we can start. Anything like that. Now, now what about uh, uh, on higher level? That is, that is, that was that was enough, 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 uh, the vehicle, the vehicle or, or, or the machine, machine what is happening. Uh, or if you take a country level, uh, the situation could be worse than what it was earlier. And the last one is complete. This all depends on exposure, understanding exposure sensitivity. So, understanding all this thing clearly, uh, now from the policy level, uh, 1989, the International Decade for uh, Natural Disaster Reduction was introduced to decrease the loss of life property damage based on. The decade was the last. Uh, the 1992 was considered a decade, international decade for natural disaster protection. 1994 was Yoga Hama strategy of uh, action was introduced in Japan. The risk assessment has to be there, so prevention and preparedness should be uh, strengthened, and capacity of the primary importance should be So that was the 
my yoga amma started yoga and then uh, 1999 un uh, international strategy for disasters un isd was uh, established exclusively uh, un board exclusively disaster related from 2005 end of yoga amma strategy introduced a uh, higher framework of action they called us hfa talks about building of resilience bringing the stakeholders in the common system of our coordination strengthening and institution so that is up 2005 after the immediate after tsunami we came out of the framework of national disaster authority state disaster authority and district level authority at that project and then each one has got its own responsibility uh lessons to learn and uh, implement that's uh from up to 2015 2015 onwards until 2030 we are going to have sendai framework the, the the solution which was the framework which was settled in the place called sendai and what it talks about is the uh, expected income i'm sorry outcome is the substantial substantial protection of the uh we have to save the life livelihoods economic loss from not their physical social cultural environmental save and persons business and uh, community should be taken care of. That means bringing uh, everyone under uh, a level of resilience that we should bring back to the normal as soon as possible. But the goal is very interesting thing. Talk about prevent new and reduce existing disaster risk through the implementation of integrated and inclusive economic, structural, legal, social, health, cultural, educational, environmental, technological etc uh, and political and um, institutions measures that prevent and reduce hazards exposure and vulnerability to disaster increase preparedness and response to recovery so i just want to highlight again the, the factors start with uh, integrated inclusive economic economic structural legal social health cultural, education, environmental, technological, political, and institutional issues. All, everything is covered, everything, industrial, academic voice, NGO voice, or institution voice, everything has been well covered. And uh, the target, as I rightly said, is to reduce the mortality and morbidity and increase the uh, ERR strategies and support development. The priorities are given only understanding the disaster risk is the first priority. Strengthening the disaster uh, discover rates to, to manage disasters. Third one is investing in disasters, increasing the funding, and then enhancing disaster preparedness for effective response and help. So this is the part is very important for community as management. Preparing the community by understanding what kind of hazards will be there and what kind of vulnerability will have and how to increase our capacity to face the situation. So the paradigm shift is totally changed. Clearly it was uh, really based now it is uh, uh, proactive, uh, reactive or proactive. So now this side of this mitigation center, it is a uh, uh, centric volume centric environment based on uh, every aspect uh, the, the adaptation has changed. Earlier it was just responsible. Now it is uh, mitigation centric. Okay. And there are five points we should uh, consider. One is the governance has to be taken care of organizational infrastructure and institution framework that's the first area we should make it stronger so that every time we do not talk about the law you can say this is not see smoking in public is now uh that's a law of the whole country so that's a governance okay and then this kind of education assessment monitoring and very important and third one is the knowledge management system which uh, is a sharing of information and good practices and reducing underlying risk factors and preparedness for the effective response. So this is, uh, we bring everything into one thing called disaster management cycle. That is immediately after a disaster, there will be a response. It will be taken care of, food will be provided, plus support will be given, recovery of uh, uh, the properties, what they lost, will last, or maybe by giving compensation. And then this kind of now up to here, this development sector. So we take the people to forget about the problem, what happened, and then coming to uh, 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 crisis basis uh, intervention, risk analysis, what is this risk, how it happened, what was the reason for it, where did it happen last time, how many times it happened, what is the frequency, how many, how many years passed until the last one. All this information, deductive sources are taken, then vulnerability analysis, and based on the risk analysis, 
which are the vulnerable uh, people, the vulnerable places, and the next one the mitigation and prevention. Based on the uh, the vulnerability and uh, the risk identified, in the proper mitigation and prevention activities, and then preparedness, and finally early warning, so that next time the same hazard kits it should go as an hazard it should not become a hazard because we have done a lot and uh, uh, very high level uh, study, and then we understood what is the risk, where it is starting from, how frequently it is coming. And then the water uh, vulnerability, especially the vulnerability, mitigation, prevention, preparedness, and finally, it's called the disaster management side. Now, I'll, I'll show you a small video, and then I'm, I'm breaking this video. It's a long video, but I'm breaking the small parts, and then accordingly, what the community I and mean, how the community is sensitized and sharing. Now, for example, understand this building capacity for disaster risk management. Around the world, governments, international organizations, NGOs, and civil society groups are working hard to build disaster risk management capacity at all levels. But to do this successfully, it's vital they have a good understanding of what works and why. Too often, current approaches are small scale and poorly coordinated within countries and across regions. But a two-year research project by the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies found that programs aiming to strengthen DRM capacity can improve their effectiveness in six key ways. Number one, focus on holistic disaster risk reduction. The first of these is holistic disaster risk reduction. We need to move beyond strengthening short-term emergency management and instead focus capacity building interventions on strengthening longer term prevention, mitigation and recovery. This includes building capacity to consider how risks may change over time. How underlying causes of vulnerability could be reduced and how different groups may be vulnerable to disasters in different ways. This is what I talked about. I should understand the geopolitical factors where the people, where the community lives, and then uh, the underlying factors could be of socio-economic uh, factors, or it could be of social infrastructural uh, factors, or it could be of um, uh, lifestyle factors. Now, recently, in today's session, they are talking about how this menstrual cycle is affecting an adolescent child. A mother was talking about what it was uh, 20, 30 years ago and how it has changed for a doctor because of the food habits and, and uh, lifestyle changes and the technologies uh, most of the children are most of the time they're spending on mobile phones not having physical activity so the mother attained puberty at the age of 14 whereas the daughter at the age of 11 so it was a factor to be discussed it's not a factor that should be avoided it is a natural process and because avoiding it so much of problems we're facing and and, and, and productivity of the women getting affected so, I'm just giving an example. You should understand the underlying factors which is causing uh, the problem in the human body or in the family or in the community or in the industry or in the country or in the whole of the country. So, uh, under, understanding the underlying factors is the first uh, thing we should understand. This Building. So, the concept of uh, community disaster risk management is why community based disaster management is first is last responder of the people. And they should first understand their capacity and then they should face the situation first before the external support which is the process reaching this knowledge and education. They might be having their own practices, but technology has enhanced them with new things and, and they should know how to make use of it. Earlier it was a small example. I heard about this when I was in school and I went to uh, to I used to pass by this uh, fort at Virabandia uh, <coughs> Katapoman. Virabandia Katapoman. At the uh, habit of visiting the Chandu temple quite often. During his visit to the temple, if an invasion of the British would happen, <coughs> so what he did, he constructed uh, bell towers at every two to three kilometers. <coughs> when he was in the temple or on the way to the temple or while turning back, if there is an invasion, the first bell from the fort will start ringing, and listening to that second bell will pass on to the third. 
and the fourth one. So within two minutes maximum, the third woman, the, the king could understand there is some kind of emergency. That even the pattern of ringing the bell could communicate in a different kind of situation also. There may be a good news also. So that was a kind of technology existed that time. They could use it. You know? So uh, the process of the indigenous knowledge in traditional wisdom, uh, many times you might have heard about the flag hoisting in the even the technology is there, mobile phones are there, but still the fishermen depending on the, the flag level, first level or second level of third level, and they understand that the traditional knowledge and leads to social mobilization that involves the community ownership. They take the ownership and easy ride and the other also. The characteristic is accountable first. People are accountable. They also understand, yes, I uh, we are facing a problem. And then second one is uh, the inclusiveness, everybody is part of it, and everybody has got a role to play. Decentralization of power, not holding their hands and waiting for the government to send the ambulances and, and uh, JCPs and fill it more. Still, so <clears throat> they should also contribute something to safeguard themselves. And the general women participation, and everyone has got a role. Rather, vulnerable population like children, elderly, differently, even chronically, and role of multiple stakeholders. Uh, earlier it was only community and government. Now there are a lot of volunteers are available. Now corporates are available. Uh, academic institutions are doing uh, research during the peacetime and then uh, enhancing the community to understand that. And particular role of media as a stakeholder, especially the public announcements and sustainability of uh, community areas. And it requires institutionalization or integration or practicing it by using models. And uh, the main tool what we are using is the PRA. Participating role of the prize uh, exercise that is by using a mapping system or using different tools like uh, in depth interview with the community, semi structured interview because many people you know, having this literacy level is very poor. So, semi structured that is by using yes or no and then uh, having a focus group discussion, collecting information, an informal conversation and interview with the, the group, standardized open ended interview, not directly asking them questions. but they may not know the years also. And they will say, uh, when it happened, when when was the last, uh, thing? when they say, when Kavaraja was the chief minister, then you can understand which year it was in mid 60s or something like that. So, the kind of formal interviews will give you uh, an idea. In interviews, they give you responders and focus group discussions, and grammatic, uh, and diagrammatic techniques, ranking and scoring. I'll show you some other things for you now. So, this is an example of uh, a community in, in Chidambaram here, Paragi Petri. Where the community elders with the initiative of bringing all the community. They draw the map by using the color paper, I mean, color powders, and using sticks and papers and, and flowers, and, you know, identifying different uh, legends. And, and they will explain these are the areas uh, vulnerable and where the vulnerable groups are living. So, this is how the community gets a bird's eye view of their village where they live. And then they say, uh, So, what, what is the use of it? The use is they can understand the resources. The first thing is they understand the social mapping. What kind of social structure is there? The village has got number one. Now see, these this are all the agricultural lands. This is the Bay of Bengal. This is the Patna. This is the Bay of Bengal. This is the only road which is connecting the main road to it. And these are the subways. So these are the evacuation roads. And these are the different kinds of houses. You can see the houses. And then there is a there is a huge tree there. There is a well is there. And a water tank is there. See, this is a water tank over there. So this is the uh, uh, social mapping, what kind of social structure, and then they show you uh, the different kinds of communities living over there, which cast they belong to. Then it comes the resource map. mapping, what kind of resources they have. So these trees are there from Kashmir. So these are the uh, trees are there, uh, trees are there. and uh, the one case of the water ponds and water bodies, agriculture land. These are the resources for them. Uh, Several right. of the social mapping we have seen already. Uh, this is uh, again from the uh, mistake in some way, or this thing. Yeah, it's a Nandi So these are the uh, <coughs> houses. These, these are concrete houses. houses. And there's a side here. And these are the road map. Vulnerability map is which are the areas that vulnerable. These are the buildings which are, which are uh, very bad condition. And uh, these are the houses where water is not enough. Where safe or not 
Strengthen functional capacity. The strengthening of functional capacity is key. That means doing more than just building technical skills and providing vital equipment. Instead, we need to improve people's ability to take effective decisions and action in relation to DRM. This might include clarifying decision-making processes, policies and planning, improving coordination and creating an enabling environment for DRM before disaster strikes. So, so for that, they have been given the plans. First thing is, is the social process. I told you about the geopolitical factors of the deal housing profile, land form, real life, people, operation, violence, and then the social inventory of the village, skilled manpower, how many people are there, healthcare, education, water facilities, transportation, communication infrastructure, and the disaster risk profile from the past history, how many times, what kind of disasters we have faced and what kind of other will happen. And contact information of the village, who has to contact and what kind of support we have. And finally, standard operating procedure, uh, maybe a, a traditional one or maybe a thought one. We should keep it. So based on that, we have to make a disaster management plan. For that, we have to sit with the community. They come to make these drawings. And then, particularly, women are very uh, incriminated and their participation is highly appreciated. They never miss any meeting and they come out with a clear idea of how to work. To work. And then early warning team, search and rescue team, shelter management team, first aid team, water sanitation team, uh, the lethal coordination team, trauma counseling team, damages team. These are the teams bifurcated by the community members among themselves based on their capacity. And the early warning team will be keeping touch with the district administration or the warning uh, center. 
and then search and rescue team will be always during uh, pre disaster they will identify the places where they can uh, safely keep the people and during the disaster they will rescue the people and after that they will strengthen those places for future as a preparedness the shelter management team will keep in touch with the houses or the shelters okay this first aid team is uh, treating uh, the patients who are affected by remaining in triad that is a person who is bleeding the brain is more severe maybe in outside you cannot see that when internally is bleeding our heart is uh, affected a heart attack uh, or a person who is a cut of fracture so he is not very serious but he wonders fracture happened bleeding but the person having a bleeding internal bleeding or a heart attack is more important so should keep those people ready when the ambulance arrives and immediately take them to the hospital water sanitation team will take care of temporary shelters and the toilets and, and the water quality quantity and the levels and the relief and coordination team will work with the district administration to give the relief trauma counseling based on the uh, psychosocial care support and damage assessment to provide what kind of damage happened what kind of uh, rehabilitation package should be given so here this is a pre disaster this is assessment mitigation prevention and during this are giving the warning evacuation saving people assessing the damages and then post disaster will report how it happened why it happened where the gap is in the future how to make it not happen and what kind of warnings required what kind of preparedness required and this is post disaster so next time a similar situation comes we should be prepared and a similar loss should not happen and uh, in this kind of first aid boxes gas masks telephone public address system emergency meeting system all these things are taken care of third one is work across organizations work across organizations sectors together. and levels effective drm requires the ability to work across different organizations sectors and levels of government and so we need to give greater consideration to developing skills for integration and collaboration building capacity for mainstreaming drm can be highly effective in bringing about valuable long term change it's also important to build drm capacities at all levels from national government to communities including regional and local government levels which can often be overlooked so that's why we work with the uh, light department at the district level uh, like like uh, fire service police uh, revenue department health department education department so various departments are interlinked and then the community will work and then the local government also is guiding it and then we should have a structure at the provincial government or the state level or the national level there should be policies and like standard operating procedure the process should be taken care of health should be taken care of education all departments have got a role to play that then this comes always we talk about only the natural hazards but this is the underlying factors like the poverty or uh, the economic system or now see uh, uh, demand equation for example that time it is it is a, a measure taken by the government to to control uh, the 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 flow of money which was not taxed so but it was bit difficult for the people to cope up with this because all of a sudden it created a imbalance in the economy so that's again one side it was good and other side it was having an impact so these are the underlying causes this also could be uh, a vulnerable situation economic and technical problems uh, so not only natural hazards need not be it could be a, uh, other factors also so we have to mainstream everything in terms of the development of planning for example give you example 100 days work Mahatma Gandhi uh, rural uh, employment scheme. That is, minimum 100 days people get a job and the training from 200 rupees. At least some kind of uh, development is happening. One is the people are getting a job. Second thing is the setting of uh, water bodies or planting of trees or something like that. So they are mainstreaming the disaster protection by protecting themselves and so, as well at the same time they are earning some kind of livelihood. That, that's how we are mainstreaming into the development of planning. The sectors we are looking towards shelter and houses. It could be for safe reasons or it could be for environmental reasons. For ventilation should be good. Otherwise, there is a possibility that transmission could be high. So the model of different kinds of houses, that even on the houses to be considered to the hillside or the coastal side or the plain. So these are different categories of the water and sanitation where water we have seen is acting as a carrier of uh, uh, bacteria and uh, the toilets which is not been constructed. Open defecation could cause a problem. Children are affected. Education is affected. Livelihood 
MSME promoting livelihood will definitely bring down the uh, criminal uh, records and then better Helsinki behavior, better uh, productivity, environment should be taken care, public health should be taken care, information communication technology uh, to, to share information at the earliest and prevention preparedness of the These are the sectors we can decide which we are. So now here it is uh, livelihood promotion. Now this is the mask. Uh, uh, this is run by a solar unit. Uh, renewable energy, they are preparing the mask. Here, the women are involved in construction of toilet, especially Kanyakuri shows the way. And we have a lot of uh, heavy uh, vehicle drivers from Kanyakuri, uh, Kerala, Karnataka, border. And uh, women show a lot of interest in uh, driving as well as making vehicles. There are so many things. If we look at the mainstreaming, uh, making the children who understand the vulnerability. Now, this is uh, um, how do you protect uh, with the warning of uh, an earthquake? Is uh, when the earthquake happened, there is possibility that the concrete on the top may fall immediately uh, sit at the table or something like that and then protect your head first. This is a mock drill, part of a mock drill. By using the games, they can make the children understand. By keeping the map of the buildings, so they can take an uh, evacuation and uh, make people understand. It's a lab where you see there is a uh, fire extinguisher is there and then the water bodies are there, windows are open. And, the uh, space between two tables are maintained. This is again uh, an example of how we can prepare this. Other than the community level, we can have the toilets and the healthcare to be uh, better and uh, rainwater harvesting, segregation of uh, uh, the, the main topic we have been talking about segregation of uh, uh, garbage uh, and then recycling, uh, using, using renewable energy like solar. And then biogas plants, where you can use a biogas plant to run uh, the turbines and generate electricity. Carefully plan and design programs for lasting impact. Capacity building programs need to be designed carefully, giving particular thought to how we can sustain all that's been achieved once a program has come to an end. Too often, programs are squeezed into timelines too short to secure their lasting impact. Ensuring that programs have robust monitoring and evaluation systems that focus on outcomes and impact is also important. So introducing programs is not the only thing. It should also to how to measure it, what kind of impact it has created, what kind of uh, behavior change it has brought into the community. That's very important. By using the monitoring of, uh, uh, see for example, Introducing uh, a development or, or uh, uh, a factory uh, in a, by, by, by cutting down the trees is not the right way for development because oxygen level will go down, carbon dioxide will increase, already factories are generating a lot of smoke. So that will cause more problem. So one side if you look at we are creating job opportunities, the other side the health is going to be sick. So we have should have a study that the environment is not. That's what corporate social is what we talk about, people, planet and uh, profit. Companies are made for profit, but they should also take care of the planet. Uh, within the limit of their smoke level, everything should be taken care of. And then they should give back to the community. The That's why the three P's are there. People, plants, the profit is the main area, and the planet and the profit. Okay. So the development should be in such a way that it should be in the favorable places, not in the vulnerable places. So like an example of uh, when, when a bridge was washed away, they waited and then they constructed in such a way that the, the waterways did not is not affected and the movement was there. Whereas here, they constructed the houses after tsunami, but the pipelines were not properly laid and it was, you know, for leakages was there and there was a lot of uh, mosquito breeding and finally the wastewater was getting mixed with the drinking water. So again, even though we have we have introduced, we have given uh, rehabilitation, but it was again creating a lot of problems. So it should be favorable and it should not create more problems. So we should be very careful about it. But that again, we should understand what kind of resources we have as uh, by using a Chanti diagram, it's called a Venn diagram. This is a circle we use it. Inside the circle, it shows what kind of uh, resources available in the village. And the size of the circle shows how much utility we are taking. Now, see, for example, there is uh, a teacher is there, a school is there, half is here, half that means for two villages, there may be one school. So here, most of the big circle is here, that means the school is benefit to this village better. Whereas a small circle outside, maybe a fire service or something like that. There is a fire service outside the village, but they don't come immediately. So the size is big, shown as a small one. So we'll, how much connected? Now see, this is a study of the biodiversity. 
now the student has made this picture. In 1960, how many trees were there? And 1970. Now, in 1990, there are only three trees. Again, that is showing that how it is vulnerable to uh, climate change. This kind of practices have been uh, for what? So, by using uh, uh, the capitals which I talked about over there, how much the relief is useful? If uh, they are well prepared, uh, for example, here the community based disaster reduction is well prepared, community is well prepared, so that the relief is not having any impact. They don't want the relief at all. Whereas here it is very bad. You see, it's only 1.2. So, they need the maximum uh, cash support they are looking for is 2 up to 3.1. So, it is directly proportional. The more they have a knowledge about their vulnerability, the more they will be prepared, the more they will save for them. They don't depend on, on, on uh, the relief. They are not prepared naturally. They have to spend, the government has to spend money on it. So, pay attention to the context. Pay attention to the context. It is important to pay attention to the local context when planning capacity building activities so that they are relevant and based on a good understanding of local capacity needs. All programs should be based on thorough capacity needs assessments. That means whatever uh, we teach them, we make them to practice like the muffled early warning system. When a warning is given, how to react to that and what is their capacity and then update it once in a while. That's very important. For example, these are the uh, uh, traditional ways of business weather. When there is a business, they used to public address system, they say that's going to be a flood and land lights are using, wireless system they are using. Sometimes voicing, people used to shout and say, run away. And then they used to have the bells in some villages. These are the traditional methods, community initiative. Other than that, now we have mobile phones, we have a uh, lot of communication system. Combine both, who says it's not required. Now, see, uh, this is the first time I talk to the people. Now, see, this is a traditional way that two bamboos and one blanket makes a structure. Do not wait for an expensive structure to be made. This girl is making a, a safety belt by using the bottles tied up with the water, I mean empty bottles around the base so that she can float. Now this is the chair is used as a stretcher. Now see this example of, from Uganda, I got this, a village where is no uh, hand washing station. The youth, they came out with uh, the waste material, the waste material, they have made this uh, hand washing station. Now see look at the children now they are practiced. Now they have a habit of hand washing their hands. These are all completely in the waste material. They are all lying in the garage and, and somebody made uh, by, by using the springs and the bottle and the hand washing. And then make the people to understand, uh, making the maps and discuss about which are the vulnerable areas, how they are making the time spending and how much uh, time they can spend on boxes. It's a mock drill, it's an example of I'll show you uh, an example from uh, Bangladesh. আমি অপু এবং মনোজ এখন বরগুনা জেলার অঙ্কুজান পাড়া গ্রামে যেখানে আশেপাশের 5টি গ্রামের মানুষকে সাথে নিয়ে একটি ঘূর্ণিঝড় মহড়ার আয়োজন করা হয়েছে যাতে ভবিষ্যতে ঘূর্ণিঝড় মোকাবেলায় এই মানুষগুলো আরো ভালোভাবে প্রস্তুতি নিতে পারে এক থেকে 3 নম্বর সতর্ক সংকেতের সময় একটি পতাকা ওড়ানো হয় এই সময় ঘূর্ণিঝড় সম্পর্কিত রেডিও বার্তা নিয়মিত শুনতে হবে এবং স্থানীয় স্বেচ্ছাসেবী ও দুর্যোগ ব্যবস্থাপনা কমিটির সাথে যোগাযোগ রাখতে হবে সালাম ভাই ও তার স্ত্রীর সাথে নিয়ে আমিও যোগ দিয়েছি এমন একটা উঠান বৈঠক আচ্ছা আশ্রয় কেন্দ্রে যাওয়ার সময় কি কি সাবধানতা অবলম্বন করতে হবে মা এবং বন্ধুকে লক্ষ্য রাখতে হবে তারা তাদের চুলগুলো বেঁধে যাবে এবং সেলার কামিজ পরে সতর্কভাবে চলে যাবে ট্রেনিং থেকে আমরা শিখছি আমরা যাওয়ার সময় যে 8 নম্বর সিঙ্গেল দেবে হেই আমরা আশ্রয় কেন্দ্রে চলে যাব আমরা শুকনো খাবারটা আবার নিয়ে যাবো চুল বাইন্ডে যাবো জানো কোনো গাছে গোছে না পেছে জানো আমরা মারা না যাই এখন মহাবিপদ সংকেত অর্থাৎ আট থেকে দশ নম্বর সিগন্যাল চলছে গ্রামবাসী সদর বলে সবকিছু নিয়ে এই আশ্রয় কেন্দ্রে চলে আসছে এখানে আশ্রয় নেবার জন্য এই ধরনের পরিস্থিতিতে বাড়িতে থাকা গবাদি পশুকে উঁচু ও নিরাপদ কোনো স্থানে নিয়ে যেতে হবে ঘূর্ণিঝড় প্রস্তুতি চূড়ান্ত
So this is uh, documented by BBC. This is a simulation actually. But actually nothing happened. But they give a warning as if the flood is the cyclone is approaching. And they are told what you have to do, what to do with the cattle, where you have to go, what kind of health facility you should do, and what the community will do. Everything is being done. And then they do certify themselves. So that is an important thing. Ami uh, understand. Number six. This is again an example of a, a village in Musiri, which is constructed as a quickly uh, to give an example. Every September there will be a, a high rise of uh, diagonal cases because uh, Kaveri River branches uh, uh, canal is there in the village, and only two months they get water during that uh, August and September. Rest of the time it is acting as an open deprecation area. So when the water comes, they use it for their domestic purpose. Also, naturally, that time immediately when they get the water. The water contaminated water it gives a uh, kind of a bacterial uh, issues and then they get the diarrhea and then one week there will be a heavy rush in the hospital so somebody noticed and and they identified there is a problem with the water that they have to go for a toilet so there is less water uh, so how to that he came out to the model problem and uh, he was on tiles it was constructed for the community initially people are not very happy but after repeatedly they have been taught about how much they are going to have health problems? They have a continuous uh, uh, diarrheal cases and things like that. Now people understood they are taking the ownership. And now see, look at this. It's like a, it's like a uh, wedding ball. All the health education uh, messages are written over there, uh, and the water is so, uh, the excess water is being used for the plantation, everything. And then people are very happy to see the lighting, and everywhere there is there is uh, happiness. So the case completely came down. So this is how. Uh, the technology works, this would have been explained this morning, how they receive it and then uh, sent to the uh, ground station, converted the message and passed on to it. And could be of uh, boards, watch alert, warning boards, and, and could be wireless and collector offices, could be of uh, through internet or through community radio or through mobile phones or uh, radio podcasts. And these are the areas how they can work it. Now, finally, I want to show. How Tamil Nadu has wonderfully now the present uh, uh, Chennai commissioner with whom uh, Dr. Krishnamurti was uh, working earlier with the uh, corporation, now he is uh, working with them. Uh, how he was the rural development uh, uh, commissioner and they documented how this disaster response to many communities was a successful story. The eastern coast of India is highly vulnerable to natural disasters. Empowering communities to protect themselves in disaster situations is essential. Community-based disaster risk management or CBDRM is a powerful tool that mobilizes and trains communities to respond to disaster situations effectively. A CB61 coastal communities in Tamil Nadu as part of the World Bank supported Coastal Disaster Risk Reduction Project CDRRP. The CBDR program starts out with hazards and vulnerability assessments using participatory rural appraisal tools. Within the disaster risk management plans, VDRMPs are created that map the most vulnerable communities, exposure to risk, actions to be taken and the responsible agencies. A hardbound copy of the VDRMP is kept at all panchayat offices. Communication and capacity building activities and disaster risk and preparedness are carried out at village level. With the disaster management committees, BDMCs are formed with representation from vulnerable groups, self-help groups, school teachers and others. Task forces for early warning, evacuation, search and rescue, first aid, shelter management are formed. Mock trains are conducted periodically to help communities to prepare for disasters and post-disaster operations. So, I really what I want to say, uh, disaster management is nothing but pre disaster, during disaster, after disaster. Preparing for disasters and reducing the risk of disaster by understanding the vulnerability. And during the disaster, responding to the disaster in the capacity 
and then after that, even beyond that, something happens. You should have the capacity to mitigate the impact of it by recovering from the disasters and reducing the impact of the disasters in the future situation. So, with this, I uh, uh, close the session. Uh, I expect your feedback or questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank sir, you, sir, for your, for your evolutionary, evolutionary explanation in the coming up in phase based on disaster management. management. And, and you have, have elaborated, elaborated the disaster impact of the geography changes in India. India. The developed the country in the US which stopped us to the disaster, disaster zone for, for the past decade. And, and also, also with the real-time uh, video example of the disaster zone types categories, you have explained very clearly. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable time with us. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity to interact with you by 10 minutes extra. Apologies, but uh, I would like to show it through the video so that can I have live uh, experience of it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's so nice to uh, see. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, this is the time to invite Dr. B. D. Swaminathan, sir. And who having the experience uh, uh, act, uh, since 1980 and actively engaged in research so far, 21 PhD scholars and 42 MCL scholars have been successfully guided. 45 research articles have been published in national and international journals. 16 articles in Tamil on various aspects of human behavior have been published in Tamil Encyclopedia. Compiled by Tamil University at Tanju, two books have been published. Uh, psychology for effective living principles of psychology in universities without any delay uh, we like to invite Sw dr swami sir uh, it's over to you sir uh, Sir, uh, Swami Adhan, sir. Uh, uh, SAR is having some technical issues, uh, so participants are requested to stay uh, uh, stay here. Uh, he will come and join us. This is our last session. Uh, at the end of the session, we will receive the feedback.
Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir, yes, you are audible, sir. sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I am using my mobile phone. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So uh, shall uh, I? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so shall I present, sir? Yeah. The thing is, actually, I am using both my laptop and uh, the uh, okay, uh, mobile. Phone. I think okay. I will be able to address. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Yeah. Just wait for a few more minutes. Every time will not disappoint you. Actually, you are yeah. going for laptop. Uh, it, uh, it's audible now. Yes, sir, it's audible in on. So you yeah, can use the uh, you please switch it any one device uh, on others. Though you will not be able to see me, I think uh, you will be able to see the screen no, or sir. Uh, my oral presentation. Yes, sir. It's uh, started. Uh, uh, is my screen visible now to all of you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, so I thank uh, the organizers for giving me an opportunity to be with you online. Uh, I, I feel extremely sorry for uh, you know, the late start. Hope all of you excuse me for that. Uh, uh, in fact, every now and then I will keep asking you some questions to make sure that you are with me. Can I do that? Hello? Yes, sir. Uh, are you with me? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so at regular intervals, I will keep uh, you know, interrupting my own self to find out whether you are with me. Uh, uh, is that all right for you? Yes, sir. Actually, we are commenting, sir. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, let me go on to the first slide and I assure everyone of you that I will not overshoot my time zone. All right. The time allotted for me is from 3.30 to 5 o'clock and definitely beyond 5 o'clock, I will not extend the session even by a nanosecond. All right. So, uh, all of you can, all of us can be free and uh, you know, we can do whatever we want after 5 o'clock. Till then, I think we stand committed to this program. Uh, so let me come out with a uh, um, standard uh, definition given by the lexicon or English dictionary. And according to uh, a standard English dictionary, emergency is an unforeseen combination of circumstances requiring immediate action in the form of assistance to provide relief. So it's a crisis situation that requires you know, immediate care and attention so that people who are caught in the web of emergency or disaster you know, are given some assistance. Maybe it is medical assistance and going along with medical assistance is psychosocial you know, care. Um, so these emergency situations definitely require the psychological touch with the support of society. And uh, there can be umpteen number of emergency situations like armed conflicts, which I don't have to tell you right now. One uh, international war is going on well above us. Uh, 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 can anybody tell me what it is? I think it is, uh, it is such a simple question that I think uh, all of you will be able Russia. to understand. Yeah, Russia's war. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Between Russia and Ukraine. And in fact, uh, this is not at all a new situation for us. In fact, we have been exposed to various such armed conflicts every now and then. And I think each and every experience that we get uh, from time to time, I think will keep us in good stead 
All that I am going to uh, you know, emphasize here is that we have to strengthen our survival instincts. All right. So we have to survive. We have to keep ourselves afloat, and then only we will be able to help others. All right. So uh, emergency situation can arise out of armed conflict, can arise out of natural disasters. Uh, again, I need not tell you what those natural disasters can be. In fact, uh, all of us, the entire universe, uh, 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 the entire universe is governed by five elements. All of you know about that. Yeah, water, fire, air, and the most illusory element, namely ether filled space. What we say in layman's term, sky. Uh, uh, probably in Sanskritized Tamil, I can tell you that Prithvi, that is Earth. Uh, in Chase Tamil, it is Nilam. And uh, in Sanskritized Tamil, it is Agni. In Chase Tamil, it is Nerupu. Or in uh, English, fire. And uh, water, that is Jal or Meer. The fourth one is Vayu or Air. The fifth one is Akash, that is filled with ether space. In fact, uh, such a situation should not arise, but even then, no, somewhere I, we must be mentally prepared for that too. Uh, there is a saying in English, even if the sky falls, I think we must be able to stand our ground. And I do not know whether such a thing will happen, because to me, the uh, uh, fifth element some uh, physicists say that I know it is just the interaction of the first four to bring out the fifth one, namely the sky, because we do not know where the sky begins, where the sky ends, the depth of the sky. The more you try to catch the sky, the more you know that it jump out of your uh, catch something like mind. So, uh, uh, natural disaster can occur involving any one of these elements. Am I clear to all of you? Am I clear? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, just from the one voice, uh, I think it is the voice of uh, uh, little Madam Priyanka. Uh, in male voice, in yes, male sir. voice, I am not a male shamanist, but even then, I want to make sure that all of you are able to hear me. Yes, sir. it's so clear and uh, informative, sir. All right, that's good. I think one voice represents every other voice. That's good. Uh, so whenever you know, the water uh, causes a disaster like tsunami or uh, you know, deluge, what uh, Chennai went through in that T1 for year 2015, and uh, probably this part of the world uh, witnessed tsunami, uh, which I think no one will be able to forget on 26 December 2004. And then earthquakes involving the earth, so and uh, Bhopal gas tragedy involving you know, the air. The air became so uh, toxic. So each one of them can be cited as a natural disaster. And the third one is what we are trying to now, you know, actually somehow wait through, namely Corona, COVID. It's such an epidemic. Probably it has become such a mega issue where lot of things go with it. So we have to keep ourselves afloat. Unless and otherwise, you know, uh, we strengthen our psyche and we strengthen our spirit to live, to uh, find relief for our own selves. And only after we help ourselves can we help others. Therefore, uh, 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 in fact, I am going to give you certain tips for all of us to, you know, uh, uh, keep every one of us steady at the time of crisis. Hope my uh, presentation to you will keep you in good stead at the time of crisis or at the time of any emergency. Psychosocial care is the culturally sensitive provision of psychological, social, and spiritual management through therapeutic communication. I have mentioned therapeutic communication in bold form because it is more or less, you know, a therapy-like situation. 
you know maybe it looks like one uh, you know general communication but the way psychologist uh, a social scientist you know uh, uh, goes about providing relief to the affected people i think that is expected to have a therapeutic value and effective psychosocial care improves the individual's health outcomes and ultimately quality of life it is more than the longevity the quality of life is what you know, all of us are unduly worried about so the uh, bounden duty of a psychologist is to provide you know effective psychological care psychosocial care actually includes a set of interventions like structured counseling then motivational enhancement case management care coordination and in some of the rare cases psychotherapy and finally relapse prevention because uh, you know soon after the trauma occurs probably they appear to have recovered from some of the you know major symptoms but we do not know always we keep our fingers crossed when we go about you know, providing psychosocial care to affected people because they are expected to assimilate our inputs in such a way that you no know, it should have long lasting effect long lasting impact on their lives and uh, should relapse occur well the uh, rate of recovery must be must be much faster than the time they have taken in the earlier instances all right so uh, uh, these are the six important interventions that we give for uh, you know under psychosocial care let us first talk about structured counseling can i go ahead yes Hello? yes sir all right uh, uh, in fact there are three types of counseling that we do uh, uh, in the domain of psychology one is directive counseling it is highly structured and there is a definite protocol for uh, for directive counseling whereas non directive counseling may not appear to project an explicit protocol but even then without a protocol we the professional psychologists do not go about providing counseling because we are accountable to the stakeholders all right so whatever we do will have to be documented in a scientific way so that no people can refer to our documents as and when it is required but the main difference between directive and non directive is that in directive counseling the counselor will you know uh, uh, explicitly play a very very active role in directing in regulating the counseling process the role of a client or counselee is to just to toe the line of the counselor whereas in non directive counseling the role of counselor may not appear as active as the role of a counselor in directive counseling all that the uh, uh, the counselor will have to do is will have to listen to the client in a in an empathetic manner probably more about non directive counseling as we proceed to the next few slides the third one is eclectic which is combination of directive and non directive and uh, because uh, in some cases directive uh, principle directive counseling principles may not work out as effectively as non directive and similarly if you follow non directive it may not you know work out as effective as it should be so what we do is we just go by the uh, you know uh, requirements and we take a few steps from directive and few steps from non directive and uh, it is sort of a mixture of directive and non directive is what we call eclectic counseling in directive counseling there are six steps the first step is analysis second step is synthesis the third one you know it is highly clinical diagnosis the fourth one is prognosis fifth one is actual intervention in the form of certain exercises 
which I think I just make a passing reference uh, because uh, you know uh, we don't have enough time to talk about you know various intervention strategies that we follow in direct accounting. But I'll just you know make a passing reference to some of the important intervention strategies that we have as part of direct accounting. And sixth and the last is the most important phase follow up. All right. So unless otherwise we follow them up minimum for a period of three months probably the longer the duration of follow-up the better it is and then in, in some of the major cases we do follow up you know for about a year or more than a year and in analysis what we do is we just observe the individual's behavioral patterns it is just not only the observation of course we begin with the observation because all of us are blessed with a pair of eyes, powerful eyes. Those two eyes will have to be used, you know, maximally to pick up points from the people who are affected in an emergency situation. And uh, we analyze each and every behavioral aspect of the given individual, probably a set of individuals in any uh, 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 Group. In fact, I will definitely, you know, make a definite reference to one Fisher woman, uh, whom we you know, with ordinary pride, I should say, whom we effectively counselled soon after the tsunami. Uh, uh, more about that case after I complete, uh, you know, this particular slide. So through observation, we get information, you know, fund of information from the individual. But observation alone will not suffice. We follow it up with interview, you know, either structured or semi-structured or unstructured, just as how you know I saw make full use of for observation, we make full use of the ears. It is just not hearing, it is listening. In observation, it is just not saying, it is meaningful, you know, uh, collection of facts through observation. So first we make use of eyes, second we make use of ears for interview, the third one only, if required, we go for a set of, you know, a, a batteries and batteries of psychological tests, which will involve a wide spectrum of mental functions, starting from concentration, then we move on to attention, we move on to memory, again memory we have immediate memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, etc., etc. Finally, the higher order functions like problem solving, etc., etc. For all this, we make you know, the best use of standardized batteries of tests. Uh, in fact, it involves you know, uh, uh, neuropsychological significance. If, if any part of the brain is you know, involved, our neuropsychological tests are short enough to detect those you know problems so we try to analyze thread pair from head to toe whatever you know uh, affected people uh, uh, are there to demonstrate as a problem just as how we analyze the second half before we move on to diagnosis is we have to assemble back all that we have analyzed and that assembling back process is what we call synthesis then only the picture becomes much more clear to us. So after getting a clear picture, we try to label what that particular condition is. We identify and label these two processes go with diagnosis. And before, soon after diagnosis, we don't intervene because there is always a possibility of auto recovery. Just one question I'd like to ask uh, 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 the participants. One of you can answer. How many of you uh, uh, who would like to respond to my query? Hello. Yes, sir, me. Uh, 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 may I know your name? Priyanka, sir. Priyanka. Are you representing the entire group, Priyanka, or are you the one and only to attend? Uh, no, sir, I'm just presenting from CWRM, I'm talking. Uh, uh, how attentive the others, uh, other participants are? Are they as attentive as you are? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They are attending, but uh, some of them are mostly commenting here, sir. 
they, they are not able to hear me is it yes sir they are hearing you all sir, right. yeah you do yes all sir. right uh, uh prenka your role is very very crucial because you are the mediator between me and uh, the other participants yes, okay yes. <laughs> uh -huh. okay just one question uh probably please don't think uh, that it is too personal a question but even then no uh, when a psychologist is asking a question it means only for you know, understanding the psyche of the individual uh, does uh, anybody you know uh, is any, uh, does anybody keep you know oneself away from pain killer suppose headache i think all of us you know get headache Yes, sir. Okay. How uh, uh, is there anybody in this group who would say, you know, I don't take any tablet uh, for uh, you know recovering from headache? How many of you rush to a painkiller the moment you get a throbbing headache? Yes, no, I'm not a person like that. Huh? No sir, I am not the person like that. I won't uh, rush with the tablets or medicines. You don't take tablets? No sir, it's... Uh, see, uh, if, if I... If, uh, the situation is uh, too high, Medic only I will prefer for medicines. Otherwise, wonderful, wonderful. That is the point I would like to make. In fact, for headache, no. A headache is just a symptom of some underlying pathology. Yes, uh, in, in fact, all that we do is that you no, know, there is always a mechanism in the human system, or probably in any organism, to separate that imbalance on its own. Just for a while, I think that person will face that problem. After a while, probably you no. Know, this is what we say technically: homeostasis, maintenance of internal equilibrium. Certain chemicals. Are immediately, you know, injected into the bloodstream from the brain, and that will act as a painkiller. So, in fact, even for fever, they say that no, don't rush to any antipyretic drug immediately. See that you no, know, the temperature does not shoot up uh, uh, beyond 101 degree, uh, uh, you know, uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, uh, yes, uh, one day then probably you may have to apply. Cold pad, or you may have to consult a medical doctor and uh, you know go for antipyretic drug to bring fever down. But uh, uh, as long as it is uh, somewhere uh, around 100, 100 or below 100, the uh, doctors, particularly of my generation, will not recommend any antipyretic drug to bring down fever because on its own, you know. Uh, uh, fever will disappear. There must be some provision for auto recovery. So when we do diagnosis, we will come up with prognosis saying that whether the outcome will be favorable with, even without any active intervention uh, or whether we need to intervene to make sure that the person recovers you know, faster and also fully. And such a condition is called unfavorable prognosis. So only after we spell out whether it carries a favorable prognosis or unfavorable prognosis, then we slowly start our intervention. All right. And uh, in, that depends upon severity of the condition also. If the uh, uh, condition is going to be very severe, then we will have no other option but to intervene either with drugs or without even drugs. In fact, drug intervention can be done only by qualified medical doctors. And uh, in fact, medical doctors will form a part of the counseling team. And uh, so intervention will be done only after we spell out prognosis in direct counseling. And as I told you in the beginning, well, even after intervention, we make sure that no relapse does not occur. Should relapse occur, we will definitely go back to step one and stop the entire counseling process. I was telling you about on Pisharuman, no? In the beginning. Yes, sir. How, how many of you remember? Yes, sir. I do remember. Ah, very good. Uh, in fact, it was a very eventful day for 
you know, me and my colleague, we formed a team. In fact, uh, uh, in fact, uh, the Department of Psychology at the University of Madras. At that time, I was professor uh, in mm -hmm. service, and uh, my uh, lady colleague was also of uh, the same rank. And uh, she and I, you know, carry very good, uh, you know, uh, rapport, professional uh, uh, ethics, so to say. And uh, she is as junior or as senior as I am. By name, Dr. Lata, an expert in yoga as well. She is. And uh, in fact, we were actually uh, uh, concentrating on uh, uh, one uh, area near Santo. The moment our team, you know, uh, arrived at the scene, uh, all fisher women, particularly fishermen, were merrily dancing. Uh, with, uh, no, with, uh, 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 during those days, Tasmak was not there, but even then, no, uh, some such intoxicating agents. In fact, fisher women were more responsive and more responsible uh, uh, than uh, due respect, respect to. Uh, 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 no men, I am saying this because I'm also a man. And uh, all those special women, women say, no, we, we don't, don't, we don't, want, don't want, want any more tablets. All that we want from you is calm sleep, devoid of nightmares, because we are scared to close our eyes. The moment we close our eyes, immediately the tidal waves only come to our mind and it prevents us from you know, sleep. For the past 10 days and 10 nights continuously, we have not slept. Please give, give us something so that we sleep you know, peacefully. And we do not want tablets. In fact, they threw away all the tablets which the medical doctors you know, went about giving them. They said, we want something more than the ta tablets. Then immediately, Dr. Lata and I decided to go through the process of diet counseling immediately. And then we analyzed, and, you know, just, you know, one woman we thought we would, you know, take as our sample. And uh, when we analyzed, her breathing pattern was abnormally disturbed. It was adversely disturbed. In fact, she was, uh, she was actually uh, taking shallow breaths. So, in fact, we were saying, you know, go for deep breathing. Let the breath come from the navel region. Uh, uh, are uh, all of you uh, aware of Tamil? Uh, can uh, all of you understand Tamil? Our local language? Because of what happened between the Fisher women and uh, myself, no, I, I'd like to present it to you verbatim. Suppose I say it in Tamil, the communication that took place between uh, uh, the affected people and ourselves, will all of you be able to understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. so all our Tamil students. Yes, sir. All our Tamil students. Okay. Yes, uh, should some uh, should anybody find it difficult to understand my Tamil? Well, I definitely uh, follow it up with uh, brief translation in English. Aunga sonna ange, you can the tablet on table. Angle the way it is. Nalla tuko. Apparently, in fact, this is what I said in English earlier. Uh, then then Dr. Lalita and I, uh, you know, inspected it. Breathing and it's a very important vegetative function. Only when we breathe in and breathe out normally, can the circulation be, you know, uh, healthy. There, there will be proper circulation throughout the body from head to toe. In the circulation, it is not a problem. Because and the mother breathe in and It was nothing short of a panic reaction. She was panting. This is what they said. Deep muscle relaxation Deep muscle relaxation begins with you know, training in uh, 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 you know, uh, taking proper breath and the breath regulation the doctor. In Gada, the spirituality in the world. In fact, the moment we say spirituality, many think we bring in religiosity. No. Spirituality and religiosity are two different concepts. Probably religions are there 
to uh, strengthen the spirit of an individual, but one does not have to be religious 100%. The word spirit is drawn from the Latin word spiritus, meaning breath. If you breathe in and breathe out normally, that means you are strengthening your spirit. Your spirit to live becomes much stronger. Your uh, you know, will to recover will become uh, uh, much, much more strong. So we gave her, you know, rigorous training for inhalation and exhalation. Dr. Lata being a lady, you know, she actually guided her literally by placing her hand, you know, on the stomach. So no, to pull and the muchu arano. Take a deep breath. Suppose I ask you to take a deep breath, you know, uh, from where should the uh, breathing stop? Can, can you practice it just for a minute? What is Are you yes, ready? Sir. Yes, sir. Take a deep breath, and uh, as you breathe in, you know, your diaphragm will go up. As you breathe out, the diaphragm will come back to its normal position. And the deep breathing is Kaparanga and the inhalation, exhalation process and the arm and the marker and the We gave her, you know, uh, the uh, uh, breath regulation technique based on several principles. This is typical, you know, Western principle: inhalation, exhalation. Dr. Lata, as I told you already, is an expert in yoga, so she gave them training in pranayama also. Uh, how many of you practice pranayama? How many of you are aware of pranayama? Hi, sir. Sir, sir I know. Pardon? I am not a guru. I am not a guru. That's why I am Okay, okay. Pranayama, okay. pranayama actually involves three one phases. One is inhalation. One is inhalation. You inhale. Uh, you inhale. And second phase. And second phase. Breath holding of breath. Holding of breath. The third phase. The is third exhalation. Phase is exhalation. So breathe in. So you breathe in. Hold your breath. breath. Hold your and breath. Then you breathe and then you breathe. And that is what pranayama is all about. Is all about. Is all about. But she was actually a she was actually a woman fisher woman because of sleeplessness sleeplessness then long day long day added to her age excuse sir yes Yes. Sorry for interrupting, sir. Sir, actually, your voice is echoing, sir. Uh, so, you please kindly mute one of your either you have to mute your system or uh, phones, your mobile phones, sir, because both are unmuted. So, it's uh, the audio is not clear, sir. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, uh, let me see whether I can speak to you without the headphones. Yes. Uh, uh, no, sir, actually, you have to mute any one of the device. You have logged in to uh, two devices, no, sir. You have to mute any Hello. one of the devices. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, sir, you are audible, but your voice is echoing, sir. Uh, you, you please mute any one of the devices, sir. Uh, let's see, let's see. Uh, in system and uh, in. Okay, sir, I will mute from myself. Ah. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, no, you can. Yes, sir. No. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Fine, sir. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a real Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Ah. So.
uh, uh, we were able to see you know uh, fantastic recovery in that case of fisher woman we intervened just with you know breathing technique and that kept her in good stead and uh, in fact when we were saying okay we will meet they said tomorrow we are expecting you and that is the response positive response we got from the group and it was because of that we constant and we followed them up nearly for uh, uh, three more years and a phd thesis also came out of our experience and one person one of our research scholars got a phd based on you know the effectiveness of counseling uh, on uh, you know the psychological well-being uh, uh, of women after tsunami uh, okay now shall i proceed to non directive counseling shall yes, i proceed sir. to non directive counseling welcome yes, sir. sir oh okay in non directive counseling the first thing that is uh, required is unconditional positive regard we have to regard our clients for whatever they are we should never feel that we are superior to them you know all human beings are equal and there is no question of superiority or inferiority how many of you agree with me on this statement agree sir okay and uh, the counselor should never think for that matter any helping professional i mean medical doctors starting from medical doctors and professors because you know, undoubtedly they belong to a very noble profession and we are you know noble not because of the qualification or the experience but because of the human touch with which we have to proceed with our you know uh, 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 helping process so we have to give them unconditional positive regard and then we have to demonstrate empathy how many of you know the meaning of empathy what is empathy yes sir i know uh, anybody can answer this question understanding the ah uh, very good listening and you feel with you feel with the other person you step into the shoes of the person who is experiencing a problem if or the talavali vandirukna ungalku and the talavali neenga anubhavikano actually ungalku talavali irukka vendam ana talavali vanda if in case you get headache how miserable you will feel and the samayathla poi ninga if you are going to whip them verbally in fact that will add to the headache am i doing it to you now no, sir. <laughs> that this is no sir no sir no sir no very good thank sir. you thank you thank you so i have so much of empathy for all of you because right from uh, the morning you have been listening 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 and i should listen to you so in empathy we actually we feel with but too much of feeling with is also not good and we will change the gear from empathy to sympathy sympathy will not be that intense you actually will continue to feel for feeling for is sympathy feeling with is empathy so ninga romba jaasti empathize panna aarambichinga rendu problems one ungalku anda problem vandrum you will get that problem from your client rendavathu the client will become over dependent on you sir so, should i breathe in through right nostril or left nostril and the alavukku unda avanga they will depend on you so and the over dependence edukkaradhukaga we change the gear from empathy to sympathy from sympathy to apathy within what it comes you feel away from them the purpose of counseling is to make each and every individual self sufficient is to make every individual strong psychologically strong and the psychological strength on the own way we detach ourselves in a very diplomatic way and as a detached attachment is what we call in apathy and if only possible you will operate even through telepathy 
telepathy yaarka theriyuma what is telepathy over the phone pandrathu telepathy ya what is telepathy no oh. Through the telephone. Ah, it is transmission of thoughts. All right. Uh, uh. Uh. Ah. Ah, it is transmission of thoughts. All right. So it is telepathy. In the man non-directed counseling fund as i told you earlier eclectic counseling is amalgamation of directive and non-directive counseling so in the man structured counseling program the next one is motivational enhancement we actually motivate the people because the antidote to depression how many of you feel sad for no obvious reasons now depression scale to the administrator if for buying us so many cases of depression you know we are treating but fortunately only 3% of them require antidepressants whereas 97% do not require antidepressants alone we actually make them action oriented so depression clear pandrathukku there are so many you know behavioral management techniques amala vandu thinking type too much of negative thinking that negative thinking will have to be converted into positive thinking they have fertile imagination and the imagination on the positive or kundu varar da engode idu adukku da we try to motivate them for which we make use of the acronym smart where s stands for specific m for measurable a for attainable or for realistic t for time bound I, i think all of you are students or research scholars or employees priyanka yes sir i, I think uh, all are here sir uh, from various uh, field they are here sir very good i told this sir please sir very good thanks a lot thanks a lot you know whether a person is a full time faculty or a full time research scholar it is immaterial all that i want you to remember to drive out depression away from you sadness from you you know please be action oriented person karma yogiya maarunga adukku da na ange inga solrom you know uh, there are uh, three or four levels of you know uh, setting our goals immediate goals short term goals long term goals like long goals so goals are graded into across you know the timeline into four types immediate short term long term like long so whether it is immediate or short term or long term or like long you know be specific and spell out your goal in such a way that it is measurable then it is attainable because external forces are very important realistic internally also you should uh, always set your goals as per your inner resources and i very much believe in time concept those who are highly time conscious are the ones who succeed in life those who respect time are the ones who respect their own selves those who respect themselves are the ones who are respected by others so uh, immediate if a Uh, i heard a male voice saying faculty uh, can that uh, colleague of mine come, come on line, line now na na kekka kelvi ki ore badal kudukka mudiyuma and the faculty welcome sir okay uh, sir if for in the session mudinjavane enna panna porenga goal what is your goal for tonight i can realize your uh, lecture i mean that uh, social care during emergency sir uh, uh, based okay. on your information i i can able to understand how could i act in future very good and uh, immediate uh, 
I think you are a married person. Yes, yes sir. Very, Very good. good. So you spend quality time with your family members. Uh, Doubtful. Or I am away from <laughs> one institution to another institution, sir. Therefore, frankly, say I am in Madras, but basically from Anamalai University. But even then, you make a phone call to make sure. Yes, that yes, sir. Yes, sir. Even though uh, as in person is different from uh, <laughs> mobile contact. Yeah, that's, that's good. good. So you are specific. Every day, make it a point to be in touch with your family members because yes, we say charity begins at home. Our service should begin from our family. All Thank right? you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, yeah, you are the head of the family. Yes, and sir. Your wife is the heart of the family. Your yes, children sir. are hands of the family. So, yes, head, heart, hands, and every other part of your body should work in unison. Even though you are in, uh, you know, uh, many different physical environments, but psycho spiritually. All of you should be under the same roof. In the era of globalization, we say the entire world comes under one single roof. This is what actually our Indian culture also has, uh, you know, advocated to the rest of the world. Vasudeva Kutumbakam. So the entire world is one family. So we should be well connected. So in your own specific how many times a day do you get in touch with your family members? Uh, two times, sir. Morning and evening. Wonderful. 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 And the, uh, it is attainable, no? Because technology helps you. And other environmental factors also help you to do that. Yeah, that's good. And Thank you, sir. you also have that uh, urge to get in touch with them. You are realistic, aren't you? Okay. And then you pay salaram ching now. For how long do you go on talking? Uh, average uh, daily morning 10 minutes, evening 10 minutes. That much, sir. Wonderful. Right. Thank you. Be precise. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I have been telling all of you, please be time conscious. Uh, right now it is 4 37. I will definitely finish my uh, presentation. <laughs> the next uh, five to ten minutes and then i will invite uh, you know uh, questions from you clarifications from you as i promised you in the very beginning i will definitely wind up my session at five o'clock all right well, so you can be uh, sure, sure of it and this is how we actually motivate people in emergency situation don't brood over things over which we have no control all right, there is no point in crying over the spilt milk. Once you spill the milk, probably that milk is gone forever. All that you should do is that see that you know you don't spill the milk again. All right, so I think that's the preparation. And uh, 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 in fact, I told you uh, in rare cases we go for psychotherapy because three percent of the population have got vulnerability for major psychological breakdown especially soon after disaster now corona has been causing such a lot of you know uh, um, pathological changes many think that uh, uh, corona is affecting only the body in fact uh, those who are uh, you know uh, aware of the state budget in fact, we psychologists have thanked the finance minister of our state, Dr. PTR Pandivel Rajan, for allocating 40 crores to the Institute of Mental Health because so many cases of mental breakdown we get in, you know, we get day in and day out. And it is because of Corona. And uh, in fact, uh, the uh, restrictions are actually bringing out the latent pathology which is there in the system. So, but it is so disturbing. Almost every day, you know, I have been sending people to IMH for proper investigation. In fact, there is one psychotherapy called supportive psychotherapy. Uh, uh, drugs are necessary 
to subtract the imbalance because a lot of neurotransmitters get involved certain neurotransmitters like serotonin melatonin uh, you know dopamine they are all very important adukonde drugs kudutha dhan seriya irukum but drugs alone will not suffice those drugs will have to be supported by our psychological techniques and we follow psychology techniques where we try to you know actually uh, try, try to, to find out what is there in the unconscious mind or latent uh, mind and we try to bring them out or we inspect their thought patterns that is what we say cognitive approach and behavioral approach is more at symptomatic level and combination of all this uh, as i told you earlier is called eclectic so psychotherapy is of five major categories supportive psychoanalytic cognitive behavioral and eclectic triggers of relapse and uh, sometimes relapse becomes inevitable and what are the uh, you know what are the factors that trigger both them don't keep yourself idle idle mind is devil's workshop so keep yourself away from both them engage yourself in any meaningful activity and that will definitely prevent relapse then please don't inject you know uh, distress in you more and more konjam dayal say the you know go according to your uh, basic rhythm if a mukasi paathina saapra vendi nerathla saapradilla neriye pe cell phone uh, i think all of us are having cell phone you know yes sir yes ah ennaikku indha cell phone vandha anike prachana aarambichathu mobile phones have made us immobile ellarum kaalaiyil indha whatsapp paakranga raatri 2 manik paakranga 3 manik paakranga net result they don't sleep at all they seldom sleep too much of electronic stimulation actually you know prevents us from carrying out what we are supposed to carry out as normal functions eating is disturbed more than eating it is sleeping unavu seriya saapradilla saapta unavu serikkaradilla seriya absorb aagradilla kaaranam urakkam seriyilla unavu urakkam uravu uravum kutti chevara poyindirukku so it is not a stress just yeah stress just yeah aga aga relax just yeah aga and money problems if the economy bayangama down aayirukku so money problems also can be a potential cause for relax and relationship issues the less we talk about it the better it is aambeyam pondaati edhukku kalyanam pandranga nte theriyala sorry i am i think i am very very pessimistic of late i feel the purpose of marriage is only divorce andalai ipo unda live in relationship accept pannirukanga idu enga poi mudiya podu nu therla it's going to create a very big you know confusion later on and certain sights and smells also will trigger the old memories and some people or places again can cause relapse and you can very well fall into old habits the those who drink alcohol no or the ones who actually get affected by relapse solvanga puliki ratta suva therinjirthana ratta smell even if it is going to smell blood immediately it will hunt for its you know prey adu puli ana manusha irukane avanukku vandha alcohol smell thevey illa alcohol endra or thought vandale podum relapse vandru all right so and the falling into old habits can also be a cause for relapse ella thoda romba mukkiyam anger anger is one letter short of danger adnal dhan thirula irundha nikkal thannai thannai thaan kaaka sinam kaaka kaava kaal thannai e kollum sinam proper anger management illa na prachana jaasti aagum if you are going to shout at Uh, what we say anger out responses that will definitely spoil the relationship i'll consult if you are going to stomach all your problems if you are going to suppress your negative emotions like lord shiva our abbe and the vishatha the tondala vechina adla and one thing if you are going to bottle it up that is works anger in is worse than anger out anger in is responsible for many many psychosomatic problems கார்டியா கரஸ்ட் வரதுக்கு அதான் காரணமா இருக்கு டயபெட்டிஸ் வரதுக்கு அதான் காரணமா இருக்கு 
blood pressure varadhukku adhan kaaranam irukku so that is why you know thiruvallavar has said thannai than kaaka sinam kaaka kaava kaal thannai ekkollum sinam ellarkum ipo and the frustration tolerance undu romba kammiya irukku emergency period la and the frustration ah konja namba undu odikku vekkum during the post disaster phase i think we'll have to give training rome was not built in a day so over a period of time only we can you know, build the human system anyway bygones are bygones and we cannot do anything about it at least from now on you know we should make sure that you know people are psycho spiritually and socially strong okay so relax prevention skills ku undu first one self care if you are not going to take care of your own self who will you know take care of you so always you know help should begin with self strengthen yourself then only you will be able to strengthen others then you will have to manage hunger anger loneliness tiredness in short it is called halt hunger management romba mukkiyam adhema anger management management of loneliness and tiredness neriya per people they are so tired they are so over tired that they are not able to sleep na sonna illa in the electronic stimulation vandadho vandudhu and in psychology we say zygonic effect tendency to remember incomplete tasks <coughs> rather than finish them is allowed to say psychological fatigue kudukudhu this has to be managed if you are able to manage then uh, to an extent you will be able to prevent relapse then mindful meditation for self awareness with positive thinking and words of self talk ipo ungalku ellarkum oru free prescription onnu thare medikonga please pass on that prescription to every other person uh, through you i'd like to you know reach out to so many people kaalaila elnda onna the moment you get up from bed you no know, you just tell yourself 10 times this particular statement every day in every way i am getting better and better every day in every way i am getting better and better be aware of yourself and come out with these positive words all right but tomorrow ninga sollunga that time all you are you will be better than uh, you will be better tomorrow than what you are today and definitely progressively you will become you know much much better as the days progress and be aware of the triggers internal as well as external and the kudi palaka ye varudna ivan koyta irpom anga and the saga pare ஏ வாடா ஜஸ்ட் ஒரே ஒரு பெக் போட்டு பார்க்கலாம் ஜஸ்ட் ஒன் பெக் ஒன் சிப் இஸ் எனஃப் ஃபார் ரிலாக்ஸ் டு யூ نو அக்க அண்ட் ஜாயின் a support group அது எப்பமே வந்து ஒரு support வந்து self support and also support of others will definitely make you no know, psychosocial care more effective and grounding technique என்றது 5 4 3 2 1 make use of the you no know, sensory modalities by error ellarume und imagination la irukatnala we will say five things for want of time i am not able to carry out this exercise for you i wish i could but uh, for want of time i don't do that but i will quick to finish uh, you just list out five things that you see around you ipo na paathena i see my specs case and uh, my uh, dates and books and uh, you know masks and the do anji enna paakreenga endra dai kurichi vechikona external environment four things that you hear three things that you smell two things that you touch one thing that you actually taste in the madri vande five sensory modalities are based panni in the grounding technique naanga vande kudukrom especially emergency care la vande trauma la nindu velila varadhukku ena neriya per vande they will be disoriented to place person and time because of the intensity of the uh, emergency situation and as i said earlier deep breathing is fantastic uh, you know uh, measure of preventing relapse and uh, always have an emergency contact list in case of emergency and the same kripa inga anga nalla thedinka vanda or idha neenga pocket maari vechikala cell phone la neenga vechukonga and the contact list irukatom and uh, play the tape through 
thinking of consequences of relapse. In case relapse being a pandratha karma on the yen and allah and then a body perk, other than you go your mind love would keep on. And finally, always Swaminadans in he form and also in she form are always available. By which I mean counselors are always available. Uh, uh, contact funding now. They will definitely put you on the right track by referring to people around. You know, the or professional service on the now just to know referral button on Pandre Anna, my own former students who did PhD under my guidance are helping me in this regard, depending upon the location and gender and the issue. You know, I can very well refer them to uh, you know, uh, places where professional help is possible. Finally, you know, the world has enough for everyone's needs, but not everyone's greed. These are the words of the father of our great nation, Mahatma Gandhiji, Mahatma Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Thank you. Best wishes. And it is 4.50. We have about uh, 5 to 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes for interaction. Please be audible when you ask any question. Sir, can you can you please uh, repeat the prescriptions? Oh, I will definitely. Every day, am I clear? Yes, sir. Every day, in every way, every way. I am getting better and better i repeat every day in every way i, I am getting, getting better, better and, and better. better thank you thank sir. you sir yeah yeah i i, I am i i am i, I have opened the uh, chat box so you can even see it every day in every way I am getting better, better. I think uh, 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 if you open your chat box, uh, I know you will see my words. Every day, in every way, I am getting better and better. I thank uh, Shiva Teja and Bhavita for uh, the positive stroke. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's really interactive. I'm just saying like lightning classes. And you have given us psychosocial care techniques and digital software for ministry and children. It's so intuitive that I just have the elaboration. And I think you want to thank you for your valuable time with us. It's time to move back to our Hinduism, Professor Dr. G. Bafir, sir, to deliver the vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Priyanka. Uh, this is a wonderful day. Thanks to Almighty. And uh, there are potential participants as well as the eminent speakers of the four. So it is my privilege to profuse what of thanks to all the dignitaries and uh, the university authorities for giving me a chance to conduct this webinar the different stakeholders in the higher education as well as the general public and the potential students participants. Now, uh, without uh, the support from the agencies like University of Madras, HRDC, UGC, HRDC, uh, we can be able to conduct the program in a proper way. So, our sincere thanks to the authorities of the UGC HRDC for providing a chance to the Center for Water Resource Management to conduct the very, very innovative uh, webinar uh, that is a need of uh, that uh, day. is very much needed. <coughs> and I thank the officials of the UGC HRDC uh, uh, and uh, the another 
man who is behind us to conduct the webinar in the center for water resource management is dr godan raman he is the deputy director of uh, hrdc always uh, giving a chance to the center uh, and the center activities through the hrdc sir we we whole heartedly thank you for one once again for the opportunity given to us another one is a person who is uh, taking the dual role of uh, academic and uh, the administrative side that is uh, dr r r krishnamurthy he is a campus director member syndicate and the professor head uh, department of uh, applied geology who concerned our request and uh, he delivered the inaugural address for the uh, one day online webinar so the center for water resource management is uh, always with you and uh, we thank you for your uh, support and uh, present your uh, inaugural address thank you very much sir then our uh, speakers the four pillars who deliver uh, innovative lectures from the morning to the evening without any tired they have given some information some light on it with the disaster management then we prepare our schedule we are keeping in mind with the three personalities everybody is talking about the disaster management disaster management like this but we plan in different way what, what is exactly needed in the particular uh, disaster areas that kind of information has been taken and the resource persons are also fixed so one among the uh, uh, resource person is dr gp kanabadi he is a director center for uh, uh, disaster management at bellu dit bellu institute of technology bellu who given a nice lecture on different uh, uh, disasters and how we can come across the these disasters with the early warning system so the center for water resource management and the university of madras whole heartedly thank you sir thank you for your presence and given the wonderful talk on the different uh, another one is the uh, very well known personality who is with us that is uh, dr uh, uh, sr ramanan he is a man who is uh, taken the role of uh, delivering the lecture on uh, hydrometeorological disaster in a in a elaborative way and that will be more useful for the participants and they will be they will be go for the rethinking of how to mitigate and manage the uh, hydrometeorological disaster in a well uh, known way so on behalf of the center for water resource management and the university of madras we wholeheartedly thank you very much for uh, the lecture given by you sir dr ramanand sir the second person is uh, third person is uh, a uh, well known figure and uh, he is the man who is uh, behind every disaster and for so that kind of personality so that kind of personality is with us and deliver a wonderful deliver a wonderful lecture on the uh, 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 based uh, disaster management with you as a management and university of madras we hold heartily thank you sir thank you for the presentation and deliver that particular uh, innovative lecture to our uh, valuable participants and the last speaker is uh, my guru and uh, my professor that uh, uh, v swaminathan sir he is a mentor to me and he is a senior most person in the university of madras in the department of psychology and he is also whenever we are calling sir please give me a lecture on this particular topic he never say no any time he is always with us to strengthen our own research and uh, academic activities in the department in the university also and he is a well known uh, people to all the university staff and the students during his tenure at university of madras and he is uh, giving, giving some, some guidance, guidance to the, to the students, students more and more those uh, people are approaching uh, professor and head country interest that kind of personality he delivered the wonderful lecture on psychology during, during the disaster, disaster after the disaster, disaster 
with, with, with his own staying. That is a very important thing. Even though it is an afternoon session, he handled it very nicely and uh, given the information to the participants. Sir, this, on behalf of the Center for Water Resource Management and the University of Madras, we wholeheartedly thank you uh, very much. And in future also, we will keep in touch with you to give some information to the uh, stakeholders. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And finally, I thank all my participants who are all in different fields, also in the YouTube streaming. And uh, based on our requests, based on our circular, nearly 281 uh, uh, participants are registered and they are actively participated. They are from the college uh, higher education side, school education, as well as the general public also joined in the webinar. So on behalf of the Department of uh, Sorry, the Center for Water Resource Management and University of Madras. We thank all the participants who are all attended from the morning to the evening session. Thank you very much. And I thank my own fellow research scholars of the Center for Water Resource Management for about a week. They are uh, planning how to present, how to conduct uh, these things in online mode without any disturbances and uh, sending the message to the participants, sending the message to the um, um, speakers and they are conducted very nicely. So I want to thank all the my research scholars for all in my center. Thank you very much. And I thank uh, Almighty to give extent to us to conduct this particular event and meeting you people in online. In future, we will uh, have our own discussion in the offline. That day will come. I am expecting that particular day. And I will meet you in person in the offline program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all the support given by the authorities as well as the participants and uh, the resource person. Thank you very much. Once again. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir, for, for your, your kind words, words and requesting all the participants, participants to kindly fill the feedback form uh, <laughs> for the uh, e-certificate. Thank you all. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Those who want to have uh, filled the for feedback form, you can wind up the session. Thank <laughs> you.